So you want police protection, is that it, Ruby? Yeah, that's it. Why didn't you go directly to the police? Joe said if I was ever in trouble, I should come to you first. He said you'd know what to do. I see. You've got to get me out of this spot, Mr. Martin. I can't sleep, I can't eat. I can't sit still a minute as long as that guy's on the loose. You think he might try to harm you? After what I did, he'd just as soon kill me, I know. Uh-huh. What did you do? It's none of your business. All right, if that's the way you feel. No, 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 wait, I, I didn't mean that. I, I'm just so jumpy and nervous, I just meant... Look, Ruby, if you want me to help you, I've got to ask questions. Yeah, I know, Mr. Martin, I'm sorry. How about a cigarette? Yeah, I'd like one. All right? Thanks. All right, now let's have the whole thing right from the beginning. Well... Everything, Ruby, no matter what you did. It's pretty crummy. But it wasn't all my fault. At first I thought... Just tell me what happened. All right. You know about Eddie Jackson? Yes. Well, I didn't. Not at first. All I knew was what Joe told me. He called me up to club one night, Club 15. That's where I was working. He said there's somebody coming over tonight, and his name is Eddie Jackson. I want you to be terrible. Take your hat, sir. Huh? Your hat, sir. Oh, yeah, sure. Here, I sister. Thank you, sir. That's okay, honey. Thank you. Here you are, sir. Hmm? Your check. Oh, oh, yeah, your check. <laughs> My mistake, I sort of forgot about things like this. I've been away for a while. Yeah? Yeah, quite a while. Good evening, sir. Hello. You have a reservation, sir? Well, I... Uh, we are very full, sir, if you have no reservation. Well, I uh, was supposed to meet Joe Ryan here. Oh, he said Mr. He... Ryan, of course, sir. I'm so sorry. You are Mr. Eddie Jackson, correct? Yeah, that's right. This way, sir, please. We have a table for you right here at the ringside. Gus, Mr. Ryan's table of champagne. Yes, sir. Very best table, sir. Mr. Ryan has left complete instructions for the dinner. Everything is arranged. Well, it's nice. And here we are, sir. Uh, this table... That's right, Eddie. I, uh... Leon. Yes, Miss Ruby. Two martinis and then left in. Very good, Miss. Two martinis. Sit down, Eddie. Joe's going to be a little late. <sighs> Look beautiful. I don't get this. My name's Ruby Winters. I'm your date for the night. My date? Mm-hmm. Joe says you've been away a long time. He figured you might want somebody to do the town with you. I'm the somebody. Well... What do you know about that? You like the idea? I sure do, gorgeous. What'd you say your name was? Ruby Winter. Okay, Ruby, take a deep breath. This is the night you're really gonna remember. <laughs> he was right, huh? Well, if I don't remember last night, my feet will, believe me. He hit every spot in town. And out of it. He even hired a cab to go gambling in Jersey. What did he say about me not showing up? Listen, after the third drink, he didn't even know you were living. <laughs> did he know you were living? Well, he didn't act like I was repulsive. That's what I thought. Joe, when are you going to let me in on this deal? In a minute, baby. He really gave you a whirl, huh? You'd think the guy hadn't seen a night spot in 50 years. Where's he been, Africa? No, Atlanta. Just got out of the federal pen. What? Yeah, I was serving six years for armed robbery. Well, you certainly got your nerve teaming me up with a jailbird. Now, relax. Relax? Sir. You telling me he was a business partner, telling me to give him the lovey-dovey routine. Ruby, there's a hundred thousand bucks in this. What? One hundred G's, cash, folding money. He's got it and I want it. Eddie? That little guy, he's got... Yeah, that little guy, he's got... Where would he get $100,000? I gave it to him. Huh? Six years ago, I gave him 100000 bucks cash to take the rap from me on a bank job. Joe, you're kidding. I wish I was. Well, you never told me. But before I met you, me and the boys stuck up the Farmington National Bank. We got 200000 out of it. The cops caught up with me, so I paid Eddie to sign a confession that he did it. He served your term? Yeah, six years. Less six months' good behavior. You paid in advance? Sure, that was the deal. He's got every dime of that dough sorted away someplace. Where? That's what you've got to find out. Oh, I see. Won't be hard for a girl with your talent. Thanks. And look, what belongs to me belongs to you. One hundred thousand for the two of us. What do you say, Ruby? What do you think I'd say? Okay, baby. Go to work on it. Mr. Joe, 
job wasn't as simple as it looked. Guy that's been locked up for all those years likes a good time, but he doesn't talk too much about his business. Go on. Well, I told Joe, I said this isn't going to be easy, and he said nothing good comes easy. You got to dig, that's all. So I said, okay, I'll dig, but I just hope we don't come up with a fistful of trouble. Federal Bureau of Investigation, Mr. Shepard's desk. Yes, he is. Just a moment, please. Morning, Miss Hill. Oh, good morning, Mr. Bailey. How was the trip? Not bad, thanks. Did you see any shows in New York? No, no to the grindstone every time. <laughs> I'll just bet. So it's the truth to help me. Mr. Shepard in? Mm-hmm, waiting for you. Ask me twice if you'd call. Good, that means something interesting's happened. See you later, Miss Hill. Yes, sir. See you later. Okay, I'm here. Let's get to work. Uh, well, at least take your coat off. All right, but Miss Hill said you were asking for me. You heard from Florida? Uh-huh. Well, come on, come on. I will, but just briefly, how did you and the New York office make out? Briefly, we got no place. No? We tailed Eddie Jackson in eight-hour shifts for six days. All he did in that time was make a tour of every restaurant, theater, and night spot in town with a girl named Ruby Winters. Hitting the high spots, huh? That's all. But he spent money freely. That's putting it mildly. He threw the stuff away. Uh-huh. And he just got out of prison a month ago. Oh, he has money somewhere. There's no doubt about that. Plenty of money. Now, what about Florida? Well, the Miami office followed that lead. There may be some truth in the tip that Jackson was working in a Palm Beach gambling joint on the night of the Farmington bank holdup. Well, I'll be... I said there may be. Miami's going to continue checking. But if Jackson was in Palm uh-huh. Beach... Now, why did he sign a confession to the robbery? You tell me. He was taking the rap for somebody else. Could be. Could be. It probably is. Just as you said, look at the money he's throwing around. Sure, but that might be the money he got from the bank holdup. Or from someone who paid him to say he did the holdup. Uh-huh. A whole flock of could be. I'll say. So where do we go from here? Well, our job has been and will continue to be the location of that money. $200,000 was taken from that bank. What did Jackson say about the money in his confession? Oh, the usual. He said he lost it on the races before he was picked up. So? So we'll have to put together all those could-bes and maybes and possibly come up with something. In the meantime... In the meantime, we keep a 24-hour surveillance on Eddie Jackson. Right. 24-hour surveillance and see what happens. <laughs> Memorandum for Shepard, please. Yes, Mr. Bailey. January 4th, subject went to theater with same woman after theater of the downtown club. Subject left woman at her apartment. January 6th, subject spent afternoon shopping with same woman. Check up with stores shows over $700 spent on clothes and jewelry. Subject went to dinner with woman, then returned... You, Ruby. Same to you, Eddie. And here's looking to you, Joe. Best friend a guy ever had. Thanks, Eddie. Same to you. And here's Eddie. To the... Yeah, honey. If we're going to the fights, I want to put on a fresh face. Do you mind? No, go ahead, baby. Go right ahead. Me and Joe will chew the fat a while. <laughs> Haven't had much chance to chew the fat with old Joe these last few weeks. I'll be back. Yeah, we'll be here, Jim. Pay the check in the meantime. Yeah, sure, baby. Anything you say. Great little girl, isn't she, Joe? One of the best. Joe. Hmm? I want to thank you, Joe. Thank me? For what? For everything. Best friend a guy ever had. Thank you for Ruby. Everything. You like her, I like her. Here's a hot one. Come here, Joe. Huh? Come here. I want to tell you a little secret. Yeah? Ruby and me is... Yeah? Ruby and me is... Joe... Will you be my best man? Huh? I haven't asked her yet, Joe, but if she says yes, will you be my best man? You gonna ask Ruby to marry him? Sure. What's the matter with that? Nothing, Eddie. Nothing at all. You think it's a bad idea? Of course not, Eddie. I think it's the best idea I ever heard. You think... You think she'll take me, huh? You bet I do, Eddie. If I know Ruby, she'll take you. And now, listen. What sparks a champion sparks you, and champions choose Wheaties. Let's watch sparking Sid Gordon of the Boston Braves at bat with a winning run on first base. Gordon's up there now, determined to keep the rally alive. Might be a hit-and-run play. It is. There goes the runner, and Gordon hits a whistling line between first and second. 
Here comes the run in. Oh, good. And runs first. He's trying for second. There's a good throw from my field. It might nail him. Sid flies. The big cloud just will see. Yes, sir. He's safe. A perfectly executed hit and run play by clutch hitter Sid Gordon. A Wheaties man, too, this great champion. And remember, what sparks a champion sparks you. Got a tough job tomorrow? Then remember this outstanding food fact. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Wheaties give you all the grain. Not just half of it nor part, but the whole rich kernel. And when you store up solid, lasting wheat power, you're hard to stop. So have Wheaties. Remember, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. What sparks a champion sparks you. And champions choose Wheaties. Breakfast of Champions. And now, back to the FBI in Peace and War. And tonight's story, Unfinished Business. Eddie Jackson was serious. Yeah, the crazy luggy wanted to marry me. Uh, he didn't know anything about you and Joe. No, if he'd known anything, but... What's the matter? Nothing. I, I thought I heard your doorbell. You wouldn't let anybody in here without seeing who it was, would you? Nobody can get by the doorman, Ruby. I have permanent orders on that. Okay, I'm kind of nervous. I understand, but you're safe up here. Would you like a drink? Yeah, maybe that would help. All right, I'll fix one for both of us. You keep talking. Well... Eddie Jackson wanted to marry you. Yeah. What did Joe do about that? What did Joe do? You know him, he started figuring the angles. The more he figured, the better it looked, and the better it looked, the more I got sore at the whole shaky setup. <laughs> it's perfect, Ruby. It just can't miss. Go on, enjoy yourself. Knock yourself out for good. Oh, baby, you gotta admit it's kind of funny. You set out to give the guy the business, and it ends up he wants to marry you. How funny about that? You don't see it? No. Okay, skip it. Never mind, skip it. I'm getting sick and tired of this business. Now, look, relax. It won't be much longer. I never should have let you talk me into this in the first place. Not much longer, I guarantee. Look, look. The guy proposes marriage. There's got to be a honeymoon, right? There's a honeymoon. He's going to take plenty, plenty of dough along. Now you'll find out where he keeps it for sure. Listen, if you think I'm going to marry this joker... Who says you're going to marry him? You just let him think you are. You can talk. You don't have to be with him 24 hours a day. What's the matter? He's showing you time, isn't he? You know what I mean. You and I hardly see each other anymore. A hundred grand, baby. We'll see each other plenty once we get our hands on that. You mean it? I'm telling you. You play this thing along, and before you know it, we're on our way to the coast with money to burn. All right, Joe. But if Eddie ever got wise to this setup... Oh, forget it. He doesn't know a thing. Right now, he's out shopping for a wedding ring. Yeah? Sure, he called me up this morning, wanted my advice. Should he get plain gold or a diamond band? No kidding. Uh-huh. And I said, diamonds, Eddie, all the way around. For a girl like Ruby, nothing but the best. That's what I said. Nothing but the best, Eddie. That's what you said. That's what I got. And they, uh, you couldn't find a better-looking ring if you bought it legitimate. Not bad. Not bad at all, Shorty. Classy, huh? Yeah, real nice. Isn't hot, is it? Hot? Hey, what kind of business do you think I run? No offense, just checking. You know I wouldn't sell you anything hot, Eddie. An old pal like you. Honest, I'm, I'm losing money at a thousand. I said it, Tiger. Losing money. I, I really hate to give it up. <laughs> oh, she's a very lucky girl. Mm -mm, Shorty. I'm a very lucky guy. Well, either way, it's a thousand bucks cash. Yeah, I have it for you right here. And uh, an extra five for the Fifth Avenue box. Uh huh. Uh, incidentally, uh, who is the lucky girl? You didn't tell me. Pretty in town. Yeah. Mm hmm. Ruby Winters. Ruby Winters. You mean Joe Ryan's girl? What? I mean, I mean, I mean... Uh, what did you say? Oh, nothing, Eddie. No, you mean Joe Ryan's girl? No, I mean... Eddie. What did you mean? I was uh, surprised, that's all. Ruby is Joe's girl. Everybody knows Why, that. Why, you don't Tell you the truth, so help me. Now, I wouldn't lie to you, Eddie. You couldn't have known because you were in the pen. Now, let me talk with you. Go on, talk. Like... Like I said, now, everybody knows it. Joe and Ruby are like that. Listen, Shorty, you... gotta believe me, Eddie. Now, Joe almost killed a guy once over Ruby. That's the truth? You swear? I swear it, Eddie. 
Ruby is Joe's girl. Okay, sorry. Okay. Yes? Eddie, you, you still want the ring, don't you? Eddie? Yes, I still want the ring. said he had a surprise he wanted to show me. I knew he had the ring. The surprise I didn't know was that somebody else was interested in that ring besides me and Joe and Eddie. Memo to Shepard, to Valence of Eddie Jackson, January 10th. Followed well-known fence, Shorty Zella to Jackson's room. Zella left room in half hour, counting large sum of cash. Jackson later went to dinner. Hello, Chef. You wanted to see me? Yes, Frank. Sit down. I've been reading over your memorandums. A couple of what I've got are maybes and could be, so beginning to iron out. Oh? Wire just came in from Miami. They have positive evidence that Eddie Jackson was working in Palm Beach on the night of the Farmington Bank holdup. Well, good. That takes care of the maybes. What about the rest? Why did Jackson sign a confession of the robbery when he couldn't possibly have done it? Right. Well, we know for sure now that the money he's been throwing around can't be money from the holdup. So it must be money... Money from someone who paid him to confess. Exactly. So we swing into action, pick up Jackson, get a brand new confession out of him. Not yet. There's one more could be I'm particularly interested in. Yes? Yeah. Well, look at your memos. Ruby Winters is spending all her time with Jackson, and as common gossip, Ruby's Joe Ryan's girl. What's she up to? Find that out, Frank, and we may find our 200,000. Find out what Ruby's up to, and then we'll swing into action. <laughs> Darling. Thanks, Eddie. You're coming in, aren't you? Well, it's pretty late. We've got a big day tomorrow. Just walk me upstairs. Big day is right. Whoever thought when we met that first night, you and me'd be getting married? Nobody. At least of all me. Yeah? Sure. I couldn't imagine a pretty thing like you not being all tied up. Oh, go on. No, I mean it. I was sure you were maybe even Joe's girl or something. Joe's girl? That's a good one. Yeah. That was crazy, wasn't it? I'll say. Sure you won't come in for a night, Cap? Oh, not tonight, Ruby. Give me a rain check, huh? Oh, lifetime of rain checks, Eddie. Starting first thing in the morning. You'll be all packed and ready to go? Will I? You uh, don't want to back out now, do you? Before it's too late? Some chance. Do you? No. This is one thing I really want to go through with. You won't be sorry. I don't think I will. Hey, Ruby. See you in the morning. Gonna kiss me goodnight? Hmm? Oh, sure. Sure I am. Hmm. Good night, darling. Hey, Ruby. Get a good sleep. Don't worry, I will. Hello. Joe Ruby. Yeah, Ruby. Joe, I know where he's got the money. What? He spilled it tonight at dinner. He said I ought to know in case something ever happened to him. I told you what to I told you. Okay, wise guy, you told me. Where are you now, Ruby? At the apartment. He just left a minute ago. All right, I'll hop a cab and come right over. No, never mind the cab. Get your car out. The car? Yeah, we're going out in the country. About 80 miles north of here on Route 17. You don't mean he's got the door out of the farm. That's where it is, Joe. I'll get the car. Meet me downstairs in 10 minutes. So he had to go with the farm. Who would have figured that? How much further is it, Joe? Any minute now. Just off on these dirt roads, but it's been so long since I was up there here. There couldn't be anybody there. No, nothing but the mice. It's an old run-down shack. Me and the boys bought it ten years ago. That's how Eddie knew about it? Yeah, when he was working for me. Oh, here we are. I remember that no trespassing sign. Joe. Yeah? 
What's Daddy going to do when he finds out the dough's gone? What can he do? He ever knew that you and me... Sure, he'd finish the both of us. Okay. There's a flashlight in that glove compartment. All right. Here. All right, come on. Sure, it's a creepy-looking dump. Uh Uh-huh. No wonder Eddie used it. Nobody in his right mind would come within a mile of the place. Give you the shivers. Don't worry. The hundred thousand will take him away. In there. Joe? Yeah? There won't be the whole hundred, will there? Say he spent ten. That still leaves ninety. She. All that cash right here in this room. The fireplace, huh? Yeah, he says the mantelpiece is up. Okay, here it is. She, Joe. Here. You hold the light so I can see what I'm doing. Uh-huh. Lips up, huh? Yeah. Okay, I'll lift it up. There it is. Metal box, just like you said. Take it out. I got it. Look, look, look at that stuff. A hundred grand. Oh, Joe. One hundred thousand smackers. Matt. There's only singles underneath. What? A few large bills and singles underneath. Where's the rest? In the bank, Paul, Joe. Huh? Rest of the money is in the bank vault. Where it's been for six years. Well, Eddie. Hello, Joe. Hello, Ruby. I see you two didn't waste any time getting here. Eddie, I, I can tell you what happened, Don't honey. Don't bother. I know what happened. All right. How do you want this? Ladies first? Eddie, put, the, put that gun down and listen for a minute, will you? I think you'll be first, Joe. I want Ruby to enjoy this. Get over against the fireplace. Eddie. Do like I say. You, you got to listen to me, Eddie. I, I know this doesn't look so good, but there are angles you don't understand. Yeah, I bet there are. Okay, Ruby. I'll take that flashlight. Ruby! Come back here, Ruby! Okay. Let her go. Her turn will come later. Joe? All right, Joe. Go ahead and make your run. You'll never get out of this room alive. Go ahead, Joe. Try it. Then a car gave me a lift and I got into town. I bought a paper right away, but there wasn't anything in it about a shooting. I don't know what to do with Eddie on the loose. So you came here? Yeah. Listen, Mr. Martin. Was that the front door? Yes. And I gave strict orders not to let anybody up here. Don't let him in. He'll kill me. Don't let him in. Be quiet, please. You're getting unnecessarily upset. Mr. Martin, don't open it, please. Stop acting like a little fool. Hey! Don't let him in. He'll kill me, Mr. Martin. Ah, dry up, Ruby. Nobody wants you but the cops. Well, Martin, these guys are from the FBI. Mr. Pick me up out at the farm. Joe's downstairs in the car. All right, Miss Winters, come along, please. What is it? These Boy Scouts were tailing me all the time, Ruby. <laughs> Don't worry. They can't keep me in the pen forever. When I come out, sweetheart, you and me have got some unfinished business. <laughs> Confronted with the FBI evidence on the Farmington bank robbery, Eddie Jackson revealed the details of his pact with Joe Ryan and surrendered his share of the stolen money. Ryan was tried and sentenced to 15 years for the robbery, Jackson to six as an accessory after the fact. No charge could be lodged against Ruby Winters. But when Eddie Jackson's term is up, we have an idea that Miss Winters won't be around for that unfinished business. You've heard me say on this program that Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. Well, I'd like to tell you just why lanolin is used in Wild Root Cream Oil. You see, lanolin is a soothing oil that very closely resembles the natural oil of your own skin. And that means that Wild Root Cream Oil works right into your skin. That's why it grooms your hair so naturally. Yes, Wild Root Cream Oil penetrates and spreads without ever giving your hair that gooey plastered down look. Keeps hair in place the whole day long, too. 
In addition, wild root cream oil is non-alcoholic, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. So, fellas, next time you buy a hair tonic, look twice, and you'll look twice as good. Yes, look twice, and make sure you get the familiar yellow and black package of wild root cream oil, America's favorite hair tonic. Again and again, it's the choice of men and women and children, too. On sale everywhere for as little as 29 cents. All names and characters used in this partly transcribed program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This program is based on Frederick L. Collins' copyrighted book, The FBI in Peace and War, and is not an official program of the FBI. In tonight's story, Ed Begley played the part of Joe Ryan, Elspeth Eric was Ruby Winters, and Frank Reddick was Eddie Jackson. The radio dramatizations for The FBI in Peace and War are written by Louis Pelletier and Jack Fink. These programs are produced and directed by Betty Mandeville. And now, this is Hugh Holder saying good night for Wild Root Cream Oil, America's favorite hair tonic, and for General Mills... Makers of Wheaties, remember. What sparks a champion sparks you, and champions choose Wheaties. Wheaties, breakfast of champions. Again, we want to remind you to be sure to listen to next Thursday's story, The Comeback, on the FBI in Peace and War. Same time, same station. This is the CBS Radio Network. Radio England, UK They still tell the story of Dundrum Bay in Ireland and of the strange fate that befell her ships and sailors. It all happened on January 13th, 1843. The bay was famous as a fishing ground for haddock. And on that January night, the bay was ravaged by a violent storm that destroyed 11 boats and drowned 78 fishermen. Not a single haddock has been caught in Dundrum Bay since that tragic storm. Believe it or not. In December 1940, Mrs. A.E. Gadsby of Niagara Falls, Canada, mailed a Christmas parcel to her daughter in Prestwick, Scotland. The ship carrying the mails was torpedoed off the west coast of Ireland. But a favorable tide floated the package and unerringly cast it ashore on the beach of Prestwick. The contents were soaked, but perfectly usable. The address was still legible, and the package was delivered two days after Christmas. Believe it or not. Radio England, you... Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's Monday night and time for our weekly visit with that excellent host and dean of storytellers, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in his study, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I see you have the old black tin dispatch box out again, Dr. Watson. You've been refreshing your memory on tonight's new Sherlock yes, Holmes adventure? Yes, boy, and while I was going over my notes on the case, I, I came across this. It played a prominent part in the story that I'm going to tell you. Oh, it's a platinum cross. Is that some kind of medal, Dr. Watson? It is, Mr. Bell, it is. It's a cross of St. Hilarius, one of the highest decorations of the small European kingdom of Grosnia. Presented to Sherlock Holmes, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bell, though... Before he was awarded it, the two of us went through one of the strangest and in some ways the most embarrassing experiences of our entire career. I call the story The Adventure of the Innocent Murderess. Sounds exciting. We'll be ready for it in just a moment, Dr. Watson. Men, in summer when you go without your hat, does your hair get dry, wild, and unruly looking? After a swim, does it feel sticky and stringy? 
Then remember, Cremel hair tonic keeps dry, wild, sun-baked hair looking perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day. As if your barber had just combed it. You see, Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oils to keep hair neatly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. It never leaves any unpleasant odor. Kreml always looks and feels clean on both hair and scalp. It leaves the scalp feeling so cool, refreshed, and alive. A recent survey showed Kreml hair tonic was preferred among America's most prosperous and successful men among top-flight executives who know the importance of handsomely groomed hair. Be sure to try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the new Sherlock Holmes story that you call The Adventure of the Innocent Murderer? Well, Mr. Bell, that strange affair began on a spring afternoon at the turn of the century. It was a beautiful day, and for some hours, Holmes and I had rambled about in the park, in silence for the most part, as befits two men who know each other intimately. Shortly after five, when we returned to Baker Street, and I remember that as we opened the front door, Mrs. Hudson spoke to us. Excuse me, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? There's been a gentleman here asking for you, sir. So much for our afternoon walks, Watson. Well, is he gone, Mrs. Hudson? Aye, sir. Didn't you ask him in? I did that, sir. He waited half an hour. A very restless kind of man he was, walking and stamping all the time he was here. Uh, and finally, he ups and out. And all I could say wouldn't hold him back, Mr. Holmes. Oh, you did your best, Mrs. Hudson. But did he leave his name? Oh, no, Doctor. But he was a foreigner. I swear I've never seen him here before. He'll be back, I'm sure. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Oh. Aye, sir. Were you expecting a clown, Holmes? Had I done so, chap, I would not have spent the past few hours wandering about with you in Regent's Park. Oh, I wonder who he is. He left us one clue to his identity. I don't see any clue. This pipe on the table is not one of yours. Hmm. A nice old briar with a good long stem. Well, can you deduce anything from that? Very little, except for the obvious fact that its owner is left-handed, is a muscular man with an excellent set of teeth, uh, careless in his habits, and uh, with no need to practice economy. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. That's a little far-fetched. On the contrary. But I think that's our client now. Meet him on the stairs, will you, Watson? Yes, yes, indeed. Now we'll have something more interesting than his pipe to study. Uh, this way, sir. Sorry, right, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. That's all right, sir. You are Sherlock Holmes. No, my name is Watson. Doc- Dr. Watson. Oh, then you must be Mr. Holmes. Since there are only three of us in the room, that would seem an eminently logical conclusion. Please, do not make fun of me. I am bewildered foreigner in your country. Oh, my friend is only joking, sir. Do sit down, won't you, Mr. Mr. My name is Priscop. Igor Prisco. And I do not Prisco. wish to sit down. It pleases me to walk as I talk. It suits me. And I am in great need of suitment. Mr. Prisco, I shall be delighted to give you any assistance I can. I am only sorry that I was out when you were called earlier. I myself was desolated. But I will waste no further time in desolation. Mr. Holmes, you have in the past performed great service to my country. And what is your country, sir, may I ask? The kingdom of Grotznia, my friend. Small in area, but great in tradition. Mr. Holmes, as Igor Priscop says, you have helped us in the past. In uh, a modest way, Mr. Priscop. Though your government was generous enough to award me the uh, Medal of St. Stephen. First class, a high honor. You were also presented with the Medal of St. Arcadu, second class. As well as that of St. Michael and the seven subsidiary angels. Oh, yes, yes, I got one of those. Ah, that one I regret to say is of slight importance. Oh, mm-hmm. But now, Mr. Holmes, I come to you as an emissary of Grotznia and ask you for your greatest service. Hmm. As I recall, Mr. Perskop, my greatest services to Grotznia were under the regime of the People's Party. The party to which I belong. And if our newspapers are accurate, that is the party which is now out of favor. I do seem to remember reading something about that in the Times the other day. I am happy to see that you are both so well informed. Let me now explain this situation to you further, my friends. There is now an international committee of powers meeting at the Hague. They are trying to decide if the royalists rightfully control Grotznia, or... Or if if your party does. That is right, Mr. Holmes. In the meanwhile, the Grotznian embassy here in London is dominated by the royalists. Unfortunate for you, I'm sure, but... uh, 
What do you expect my friend to do? He's hardly a politician, you know. I have come to London to make contact with our exiles here. The embassy must not know. No one must know that Igoro Priska is in London. Mr. Holmes, my very life is in danger. For the sake of my beloved Grotznia, I want you to let me stay here in Baker Street. In secret. That uh, is an unusual request, Mr. Yes, Priska. a completely impractical one, sir. There's a little room here. There's I, a room. I... I must insist. You, you, Mr. Holmes, hold the order of St. Stephen first class. You're a friend of my people. Now, now, you, you must help me. You must. Good Lord, he, he's fainted. Very emotional, these foreigners. No, Watson, no. Look at that stain on his shirt. He's been wounded. Obviously, at least one of his enemies knows that he's in London. That's why he came to us. Well, it's only a fresh wound in the shoulder. I'll bandage it up. I, see. I have some smelling salts here. That'll bring him round. There we are. Uh, ha- hand me that, that glass, will you? He's oh. coming to of his own accord. Oh. Oh. Here you are, Mr. Priscop. Drink this. Oh, no. No medicine. I do not believe in them. Never mind about that. You try this. Oh, thanks, no. Forgive my display of weakness. Why didn't you tell me that you'd already been attacked, Mr. Priscop? Oh, it is but a scratch. A clumsy attempt from the darkness as I returned here. I did not wish to alarm you over nothing. Nothing? <laughs> Somebody attempts to murder you, you call it nothing. I repeat my request, Mr. Holmes. Will you let me stay here a while? Very well, Mr. Priscop. Since your life is in obvious danger, you may stay here in Baker Street. Da propaspo, Mr. Holmes. I thank you. And let the Tsinaku Orchestra play for the Embassy Ball in Belgrave Square. Here in Baker Street is the true embassy of Grozny. Gracious me. There are two nice brown eggs facing you, Watson. Why glower at them? Why not get on with your breakfast? Oh, I've got no appetite, Holmes. The whole routine of my life has been turned topsy-turvy since you let that fellow Priscop stay here. It's a pity that this modest flutter of excitement should upset your lives to such an extent. However, it may interest you to know that my brother Mycroft regards our action in sheltering Priscop as a very important one for England. Oh, has Mycroft been here this morning? Yes, before you were up. As you know, Mycroft is the unofficial oracle of our foreign office. He feels that the Groznian royalists are so closely allied to the court of Prussia as to constitute a menace to our country. Good gracious me. However, he also feels that the Committee of Powers at The Hague will rule in favor of the People's Party. If that does happen, the fact that we have helped Priscop will place the Foreign Office in a very favorable position with the new government. I see. Well, that makes it rather different. I, I think I will tackle those eggs after all. Uh, where is Mr. Priscop now? In the next room, conferring with a politi- political friend of his by the name of Carlo Tarfush. Well, I must say they do have extraordinary names. Carlo Tarfush. <laughs> Sounds like a double barrel sneeze. Ah, Mr. Tarfush. Allow me to introduce my friend, Dr. Watson. Dr. Uh, Watson, how do you do? How do, you do? And um, how did you find your compatriot? Oh, in splendid spirits and in splendid hands, Mr. Holmes. On behalf of Grotznia, I thank you both for giving him sanctuary. Oh, nothing at all, sir. Nothing at all. Very happy to have been of any assistance. Right. Come in. And I must be leaving, gentlemen. Good day to you. And again, my most sincere thanks. Oh, pardon. It's got a parcel, gents. It's for a Mr. Prispop or something like that. Oh, here you are, young fellow. I'll take it. No, I want to give it to Mr. Holmes. Lummy. Just wait until I tell me old mum I've talked to the great Sherlock Holmes. She won't half be proud. Here you are, Mr. Holmes. And here's a shilling for your trouble, my boy. Cool, Bob. Thank you, Governor. Be careful, Holmes. That package is addressed to Priscop. It might be a time bomb, you know. Mm, it's sent from the Weintraub Importing Company. We'll see if Mr. Priscop ordered any delivery from there. Ah, there you are, Mr. Priscop. This uh, package just came for you. Were you expecting it? Ah, oh, yes. The propaspo, Mr. Holmes. It is from the Weintraub Company. It must be my Vinku. Your what? Vinku. Vinku, the wine of my country. Where would Grotznia be without Vinku? The distilled essence and life of whortleberries. No English drink can compare with it. Uh, perhaps you will join me in glass? I think not, thank you. It's a little early in the day. Well, I quite agree with you, Holmes. Then I shall retire to my room alone and sample this Grotznia nectar. I shall see you later, gentlemen. 
How can he keep a clear head if he starts drinking at this time of the day? I doubt if the essence of whortleberries is too potent. At least uh, to a Grosnian. Well, it's got someone else at the door. We have all the privacy of Paddington Station. Uh, come in. Ah, so. Good morning, young lady. W- what can where I... Where is he? Tell me where he is. First, tell me who you are, please. I am lovely. Lovely Michelso. Where is Priscop? Lead me to him. Mr. Priscop is under my protection. Before you see him, I insist on knowing your business, madam. You are hiding him. But I will find him if I have to search the closet in his house. This door leads to another room. Perhaps he's in there. Come back. Grab her, Watson. You'll miss this. Please come. You'll train her. You will betray her. She's insane. She's insane. There. Justice is done. Do with me what you will. Quick, Watson. How's Priscop? He's dead, Holmes. Shot through the chest, another through the arm. The third shot broke the bottle of wine. Justice has been done. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Tavos? You must save Lavery. She's my fiancée. She had good reason to think Prisca a traitor. But she shot him down in cold blood, sir. She did it for Grazmir. She committed murder practically under our very eyes. She must pay for it. And Dr. Watson and I will have the greatest pleasure in testifying against her. Until her trial takes place, I have nothing further to say. You seem particularly engrossed at the times this morning, Holmes. I'm reading the report of the trial of Lavery McKelso. Well, I can't see why it's dragging on for so long. We gave our evidence two days ago. The case is perfectly clear. She shot Igoro Priscov or whatever it was before our eyes. She's a murderess. They should hang her. Yes, yeah, Sir Francis Jackson, her counsel for the defense, apparently does not share your, your opinion. He's an extremely clever man. After cross-examining the police sergeant yesterday, he asked for an adjournment until noon today. On what grounds? He wishes a fresh post-mortem made. The police surgeon had not examined the contents of the stomach of the dead man. Why, no, should he, Holmes? Priscoff was shot to death. We saw it happen. What's Sir Francis up to? I think I'm beginning to suspect, Watson. And I pray for the sake of my own reputation that I'm wrong. However, it's no use sitting here in Baker Street surmising. Let's go over to the Old Bailey and hear what the post-mortem report discloses. <laughs> Gentlemen of the jury, I will read to you the final paragraph of the Home Analyst's report. <coughs> Sufficient cyanide was found in the stomach of the deceased to have killed three men. <laughs> As you know, cyanide is an almost instantaneous poison. Between this report and the medical evidence you have already heard, there can be no doubt that the deceased Igor Priscop was already dead when the defendant fired the bullet into his body. I therefore instruct you to acquit the defendant. Good heavens, Holmes. You realize this whole case made us look ridiculous? I am well aware of the fact. It's a stigma on our professional reputations. And a stigma that must be removed. Well, look out here. Here comes Carlo Tafush, fiancé of the girl who's just been acqu- acquitted. Well, Mr. Tafush. I imagine you're very happy. Oh, of course I am, Mr. Holmes. And I'm marrying Lavery today, as soon as the police release her. Indeed? Yes. And uh, in the meanwhile, I have a commission for you. Find the real murderer of Igoro Priscop. Find him, Mr. Holmes, or you will become the laughing stock of all Europe. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll find out if Sherlock Holmes does find the real murderer of the Goru Priscup. Men, on hot, sticky summer days, your hair needs extra special care. And when you buy a hair tonic, why not buy one that does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome? Why not get your money's worth and buy Kremel hair tonic? No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. Kremel gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. 
It keeps the hair perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, most humid summer day. It never looks or feels greasy or sticky. In addition, Cremel is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so clean, cool, alive, and tingling. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. So buy a bottle of Cremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use this highly specialized hair tonic daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic, a nationwide favorite among America's most successful men. Well, Dr. Watson, it seems to me that you and the great Sherlock Holmes are in a bad spot. A man poisoned and then shot under your very eyes. Yes, Mr. Bell, but I can assure you that Holmes, as soon as he returned to Baker Street from the trial, plunged into a fine frenzy of activity. He was examining the top of the table under his microscope for traces of poison where the bottle of wine had been shattered. You've been hunched over that microscope for hours, Holmes. No results yet? Not as yet. Well, I was just reading the Evening Gazette. There's an interesting article on the Grosjean situation. Oh, well, what does it say? The committee in The Hague has ruled for the People's Party. And our friend Carlo Tarfush, the one who married the girl Lovely, is to be the new ambassador here in London. Indeed, how very interesting. It goes on to say here that they've established that the dead man, Igoro Priskov, never was a traitor. The poor girl was deceived by false evidence. The villain who deceived her is who fled to Germany. I was right. This stain, beyond question, is that of wine mixed with cyanide. Now to track the history of that bottle. We know that nobody tampered with it after it went from the messenger boy's hands to Priskov's. Therefore... But how are we going to find that boy again? This is a job for my band of street urchins, the Baker Street of regulars. Round them up, Watson. Tell them I'll give a golden sovereign to the boy that brings him to me first. Cool. Of course I remember delivering that parcel to you, Mr. Holmes. Did anyone accost you on your way over here to deliver it, Charlie? Yes, Mr. Holmes, they did. A oh, young lady, was it? Yes, it was. How did you know, sir? Describe what happened, Charlie. Well, Mr. Holmes, she spoke to me on the street. Nice and friendly she was. And then she took me in a tea shop and gave me a raspberry tart and a nice big cup of tea. Where did you put the parcel? On the chair beside me. Oh, it's easy to see what happened, Holmes. She switched the, the parcels. Quite. Charlie, was the young lady a foreigner? Yes, Mr. Holmes. She didn't half talk funny like. Look at this photograph. Was that the young lady who you're talking about? That's her, all right, Mr. Holmes. Blimey, you know everything, don't you, sir? Not quite, Charlie. Here. Here's five shillings for your trouble. And I'll be off with you. Two, five, Bob. Thank you, Governor. So the girl was guilty all the time. But I... I don't see her motive. I do. And we're going at once to the Grosnian Embassy. Remember... She's now the ambassador's lady. I intend to let her know that I do understand. Mr. Holmes, your conversation is very interesting. But surely I do not have to point to an intelligent man like yourself that I've been tried and acquitted of murder. Under your delightful Anglo-Saxon law, double jeopardy, I cannot possibly be tried again. Oh, just the same. You're a murderess. Am I? You were no passionate patriot. You never believed in that forged evidence. You simply killed Igor Priscop because with him out of the way, you knew that your future husband would become the ambassador. In my country, we have a proverb. Inshko na vili greshko lumagin. What on earth does that mean? Ammunition is more persuasive than strategy. Mr. Holmes, you have no ammunition. There is nothing you can do to me. And so, I wish you both good night. <laughs> The 
There must be some way of catching her, Watson. There must. Well, you've been outwitted before, Holmes. People forget it. They don't like to remember your triumphs. To blazes with the people. I must account for this to myself. Hand me that evening paper, will you, Watson? Uh, there you are. Where was that article on Grosnier that you read to me earlier? Uh, second page, I think. Ah, here it is. But I have ammunition, Watson. The lady was wrong. What on earth are you burbling about, Holmes? We must draft a telegram to Mr. Tarfush, the new Grosnian ambassador. We'll ask him to hold a party of all the most important Grosnian attaches. There, my dear Watson, amid the bright lights and gay music, I shall have the utmost pleasure in proving to the ambassador's wife that she's far from invulnerable. <laughs> Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Ambassador? The Apaches are waiting in the library. You said that you would expose poor Pritzkoff's murderer. Now, why should we wait any longer? I shall be most happy to explain it now. Come on, Watson. Right you are, Holmes. Your wife is in the library, too, Mr. Tarkos? Yes, Mr. Holmes, and she is as curious as I am. Now, here we are. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. At my request, Mr. Sherlock Holmes has been trying to find the murderer of poor Igoru Priscott. He tells me that he is now ready to make his report. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, I realize that my revelation will be something of a shock to you all. I have proof beyond doubt that the person who murdered Igoru Priscott by poison is the same person who fired those shots into his already dead body. Your own wife, Mr. Ambassador. But that is ridiculous, Holmes. We know that she misguidedly shot at Prescott after he was dead. But she did not poison him. I can prove that she did. I have the boy outside, Mrs. Tarfush, that you took into the tea shop when you changed the bottles of wine. I have the evidence of the stains on the table that show traces of the poisoned wine. Do you wish me to prove my case? Larry? Why do you not answer him? I do not wish to, Carlo. And I do not have to. Under English law, I cannot be tried again. But, Lavery, you stand accused before your fellow countrymen. Uh, perhaps I can clear up a slight misapprehension. It is true, is it not, Mr. Tarfush, that Grosnian law does not recognize the doctrine of double jeopardy, and therefore a Grosnian could be tried twice for the same crime? Of course. It is also true, isn't it, that the Committee of Powers in The Hague has recognized that the People's Party has been all along the true government of Grosnia? That also is true, Mr. Holmes. And an embassy is extraterritorial. Acts committed there are punished by the laws of the nation whose embassy it is. You are correct, Mr. Holmes. This embassy here is Grosnian ground. So was 221B Baker Street when Mr. Priscop was murdered. Therefore, your wife committed her crime in Grosnia. She may still be arrested, tried, convicted, and executed by Grosnian law. Mr. Ambassador... I demand that your embassy guards arrest this murderess. Anything interesting in this morning's post, Holmes? Yes, Watson. And um, when you come to write your story of the uh, Grosnian murderess, these three missives will provide colorful footnotes. Oh, what are they? The uh, first is a note from Carlo Tarpush. He is resigning the embassy and entering a monastery. He says, um, I served his country but destroyed his life. Well, I'm afraid he loved that dreadful woman. What else did you get? The second is a package from the Grosnian government. Good Lord, uh, look. What is it? Oh, good Lord, the Platinum Cross. The Order of St. Hilarius. What's the funny-looking thing hanging from it? It looks like some strange animal. Half horse and half something else. Now that, my dear chap, is known as a hippogriff. A fabled beast with the head and claws of a griffin and the hoofs and tail of a horse. The order of St. Hilarius is a high order, but St. Hilarius with hippogriff is higher still. I'm uh, very flattered. What was your third communication? A letter from my brother Mycroft. He says, uh, thanks to your work, Grosnia has signed a British oil concession. The Empire is grateful. That's very nice, Holmes. Yes, Watson, yes, very nice. But uh, just... Grateful? I mean to say, not even grateful with Hippogriff? (laughs) 
girls, those famous million-dollar powers models you see on magazine covers, always have to keep their hair shining bright with gleaming highlights. Now, here's how they do it. We glamourbade our hair with cremel shampoo. And I want to state right here and now that no other shampoo leaves the hair more sparkling clean. Really, girls, you'll be amazed how cremel shampoo reveals all your hair's natural gleaming luster. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. Cremel shampoo is not a cream shampoo, not a soapless shampoo, not a harsh soap, not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. After a cremel shampoo, the hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights. And cremel shampoo is one shampoo you can buy which never dries or breaks the hair. In fact, it even has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair so much softer, silkier, with a lovely satin smoothness. The hair holds a wave better, too. So, ladies, buy a bottle of cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair, a vision of shining beauty. K-R-E-M-L, cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me think. Next week. Next week for our final broadcast of the season, I think I'll tell you about one of the most gruesome adventures that we ever encountered. It took place in the famous torture chamber, now a museum, in the castle of Nuremberg in Germany. I call it The Adventure of the Iron Maiden. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight. With original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo. Inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. When Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Iron Maiden. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Radio England, UK, Dennis O'Hampsey lives as a legend in Ireland for two reasons. First, he was a talented and beloved harpist. Second, O'Hampsey had lost his eyesight at the age of three. For 109 years, he was unable to open his eyes. But in the last moments of life, while playing his harp, his eyes suddenly fluttered open. And then, O'Hampsey, the blind harpist, died with his eyes wide open. Believe it or not. <laughs> Somewhere in Botts, France, a treasure of gold lies buried near the church of San Guineau. Unfortunately, there's not even the crudest treasure map to follow. Only the dying words of the builder, who said he buried the treasure in a spot touched by the shadow of the church tower. Today, more than 400 years later, the treasure remains unfound. Believe it or not. <laughs> Radio England, you, 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 Hard-boiled action and mystery as told by Jeff Regan, investigator. So stand by for trouble. Stand by for suspense. Stand by for adventure. In tonight's story, The Lady with the Golden Hair.
And now, here's Jack Webb as Jeff Regan. Well, this is the way it started. I was sitting in the lion's den waiting for him to get off the phone so I could ask him about my expense sheet on that New Orleans thing. I don't thing. care what kind he of He was playing the usual games with his lawyer. And just about like the time he hung up and he turned his chair my way, the office door opened. All right, Regan, what do you want? Aha! A little curly-headed man, about 40, dressed in a black suit, was standing there. He was holding a stack of $50 bills, a gold-headed cane, and a red card in one hand. In his other, he had a black derby with a hole through the top of it, a pair of suede gloves, and a white carnation. He stood there, looked at both of us. The lion looked at the $50 bills. I looked at the little man. Aha! You are Mr. Lion, no? I, Max Vladney, have come to see you unappointed... There you are. Uh, my name's Regan. This is Mr. Lyon. Aha. You will do it. Uh, won't you sit down, Mr. Uh, Max Vladney. Vladney, Max. 1642 Mulholland Drive, Hollywood 28. On Imperial Studio Payroll. Time I do not have. I will not sit. Aha. I demonstrate. See you. That flower I do not need. This. A ticket because I too long park. I also do not need. Cane, I place here. A gift from my grandfather. I keep that. Also, gloves. Now, what have I left, gentlemen? Uh, quite a bundle of cabbage, uh, cash, Mr. Vladimir. Yeah, yeah. From bank I just arrived. Also, this I do not need. For you. All for you. Well, 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 Mr. Vladimir. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, what I have. You, I answer myself. Bullet hole in heart. See you. Oh. Uh, is not finished. One, two, three. Yeah, those look like 38 slugs. Where'd you get them? Out of doorway. I dig them where I'm shot last night in my home. Well, who's shooting at you, Mr. Vladney? This, if I know, I shoot back. I have no enemies. Everyone is madly in love with Max Vladney. I must buy new hats. Cannot buy new hats. Kindly, you will guard my body from dying. Of course, of course. Now, you've certainly come to the right place, Mr. Bladney. If your life has been threatened, you can depend on International Detective Bureau to see that no harm comes to you. Therefore, it is so. We see. I understand perfectly. Well, if somebody shot at you last night, why didn't you call the police? Uh, Mr. Regan meant to ask uh, who recommended you to International. Aha, uh -huh, I explain. In Imperial Motion Picture Studio, where Master of Makeup, Max Vladney, who is great, is imported to create beautiful faces from skinny skulls and fat necks, is much newspaper. Free sometimes for agents to press. Hollywood police might think because I work on great gun epic, tie my rope tight, is free trick for agents to press. But is not joke. To you, I come to take no chance. Yeah. In I am, Mr. Regan. Of course you're in, Mr. Vladney. And Mr. Regan here will stick right by your side until we can get to the bottom. Of all now, this. wait a minute. If I have to, I'll use every man on my staff to protect your life, Mr. Vladney. All the resources of International Detective Bureau are behind you. Regan, I'm entrusting you with Mr. Vladney's life. Already better, I feel. We start. And call me, Regan. Call me. I know. Call you if I run into trouble. Come on, Max. <laughs> well, you can see how it was. Max Vladney's car was parked in a red zone in front of the building, and there was another ticket on it. He tore that one up, too. On the way out to his house, I tried to get a little more information, but it didn't come to much. He couldn't figure out why somebody was shooting at him or who was doing it. It was about six o'clock when we pulled up in front of his house on Mulholland Drive. One of those little places with a big sun porch in front of it and an egg-shaped swimming pool in front of that. He was pulling things out of his pockets Somewhere looking for the keys of the front the door when it happened. See, see what I tell you. All the time shooting at Maxie, someone. All right, get on, get on. What I tell you, my heart is full again of hope. All right, shut up. You aren't hit. But he's frightening. Well, unless he's got a machine gun, he can't find anything more. Wait, where go you? You leave Max to be killed. I'm going after him. Stay right here. You'll be all right. I started for the heavy brush outside the clearing of the house where white gun smoke still hung around the trees. And then I saw him. 
It was a gray-haired man, stocky build, glasses, about a hundred feet away, running down the hill, waving a gun. I went after him, but I couldn't get a clear shot. Oh, he was quite an acrobat. He dived over a wooden road bracer and went skidding down the embankment. By the time I got there, he was climbing into an old Chevy convertible, and he took off in a cloud of dust. I couldn't see the license plate on the car. darling. Something like this happening to you. Oh, Max, Max, why would anyone want to do such a thing? It's beyond me. I got back to the house ten minutes later, and there was a black convertible in the driveway and a very blonde girl in the doorway. She was digging the new slugs out of the woodwork with a pen knife. Max was lying on one of the beach chairs. When the blonde girl saw me, she pulled off her sunglasses and held out her hand. How do you do? You're Mr. Regan. Did you kill him? I got away. Oh, and I am again to be shot at. You say he got away, then you saw who it was. Part of him. Who are you? Oh, I beg my pardon. Uh, this is Hilda Graham. You have seen her in pictures. The hair, I have seen her differently. She's my wife, almost. Did you see anybody? Well, I heard the shots as I drove up and found poor Max by the door. He's got to stop this business, Mr. Regan. He's got to stop. Next time, maybe... Well, it certainly the... does have to stop, Mr. Regan. Max, why, he's the finest makeup artist in the world. Be a great loss to everyone in Hollywood if anything ever happened to you. You see, see, am I valuable? Did I not tell you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell yeah. me. Where's your phone? Oh, in there, in my private workshop. Study where I have to live. Use it, please. Call Mr. Lyon and stop the shooting. Oh, man. Darling, this is all so terrible. After all you've done to me, now I should be able to do something to you. I think so helpful. Lyon. Please, darling. This is me. I'm calling from Max's. Somebody just threw six bullets all over the place. What? Is Max all right? Didn't even come close. Oh, good, good. Now, the Treasury Department tells me he paid 20000 last year in income tax, and he can afford a little protection. Well, whoever it is got away. I think we ought to turn this over to the cops. The cops? And let them do for free what we're getting paid to do? Not on your life, Regan. What about his life? Yeah, uh, we'll worry about that, too. Now, listen. I'm sending Joe Candy out there to give you a hand. Now, this lad is a first-class gold mine as far as I'm concerned, and that means as far as you're concerned. I don't care what Until you... Until then, do anything you want. So long as you stick by Maxie and don't call the cops. Mr. Regan? Yeah. You want one? No, thanks. I have something much better than that at my house. I'll bet you have. I live all alone in Toluca Lake. End of the canyon. I'll remember that when I get thirsty. Who do you suppose is shooting at Max? You tell me, lady. I just met him. I thought you said you saw whoever it was. I did. Well, aren't you going to look for him or send out an alarm or whatever you do? Yeah, whatever we do. I see. Don't you think you ought to be in there holding hands with Max? He's had a hard day. Max? Oh, he's resting now. Do you think he's the kind I'd really have something in common with? I wouldn't know, lady. Well, um... As a matter of fact, I was just leaving. I have to be at the studio early tomorrow. If there's anything I can do at all, I'd be only too happy to cooperate. Yeah, well, why don't you start by giving me those slugs you were digging out of the doorway? Oh, I completely forgot about those. Here, I meant to give them to you. Thanks, I'll need these. Really, whatever on earth for? A comparison test. The ejector marks, the firing pin dents. You can tell if they were fired from the same gun if you want to look into it. And, of course, being a detective, you want to look into it. That's right, I want to look into it. Well, Mr. Regan, it's been nice meeting you. I know you'll take good care of Max. If there's anything I can do... Yeah, I'll give you a ring. Bye, Mr. Regan. Until we meet again. I followed her out the door and watched her pat Max on the head, kiss him on the cheek. And then she slid under the wheel of that convertible like she'd been built right along with it. That famous gold in the hair was blowing behind her by the time she got onto the main road. Be careful, careful. How lovely she is, Mr. Egan, huh? Yeah, Maxine, she's just fine. For her, too, you must keep me alive. She needs me. Yeah. What now? We wait for another guy. 
Aha, reinforcers! I like you, Mr. Regan. Already better, I feel. Only me, Regan. Take it easy. Oh, Chanto. Come on in. What took you so long? I stopped by police ballistics on the way out. Oh. I had them 38 slugs that Max brought in check. Well, well, I got some more for you. Well, I found a winner. Gun belongs to a feller named Pete Berger. Mm-hmm. Ain't no permit on it. He done 6 to 18 in San Quentin once for robbery. Sprung a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. Address? Yeah, place on Figaro right off of Sunset. Here. Thanks. Well, he was around again this afternoon, shooting things all over the place. I wonder what the connection is. I'm going to find out before Maxie does. You take over, Joe. Okay, where's our clay pigeon at? Roosting in there. Now, keep your eyes open, Canto. I'll get back as soon as I can. Oh, take your time, son. Joey the Canto is on the job. Yeah, I feel better already. <laughs> in our midst, boy. Hey, uh, hey, uh, get, get a look at that, will you? White straight and off. Curly haired. Maybe he's... Uh, yeah, shine. He's got big feet. Uh, yeah. Awful big feet. Right there, right there. What'll it be, mister? Mom, champagne or beer? Neither one, lady. Well, we ain't got either one for you, copper. Mm-mm. You picked wrong tonight. Flossie never picks them wrong. I can tell by your feet. You're paid by the city or you're a private peeper and somebody else pays you. Makes no difference to me. All spelled copper. What do you want? No fuss with you, Flossie. I'm looking for Pete Berger. Who? Pete Berger. This is his last address. Ain't never heard of no Pete Berger, and neither has anybody else. And he ain't never lived here, and, and you got a wrong steer. That door lead to rooms upstairs? Yeah, that door leads to rooms upstairs. Mind if I take a look? I mind a lot of things, Seamus. And taking a look is one of them. All right. This Pete Berger you don't know and never heard of was throwing a lot of lead around yesterday and today, and I'm going to take a look anyway. Wait. Hey, hey, you can't go up there. I was only halfway up when a man in a gray sweatshirt backed over to the top of the stairs. There were three red holes just about the center of the sweatshirt. He turned around and tried to say something. I saw what was going to happen, and I hugged the side of the banister. Oh, Pete. 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 Oh, Pete. She ran over and was kneeling beside him, holding his head in her arms, rocking back and forth. Yeah, you guessed it. It was the same man I'd chased all afternoon, and he didn't live five seconds. We'll return to Jeff Regan, investigator, in just a moment. But first, here's an important message from the Adjutant General's office. At no time in our nation's history has it been more important to develop an outstanding Army medical department. Without an adequate nurse corps, this cannot be accomplished. And nurses are still needed to fill the estimated requirements for 1948. If you're a graduate registered nurse, over 21 and under 45, you are invited to apply for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve. If you are selected, you may choose either active duty or inactive status. Apply to the Adjutant General, Washington 25, D.C. And now, back to the story of the lady with the golden hair. And Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, after he came falling down the stairs at me and Flossie had a good cry over him, there wasn't anything to do but to call Central Homicide. They got there a few minutes later and went over the whole place, taking pictures and prints. Finally, a wagon pulled up and took what was left of Pete Berger down to the morgue. Detective Lieutenant Salvatore Windetti, up to Homicide, asked everybody a lot of questions and shipped a couple of people downtown for a couple of different things and finally got around to me. Regan, 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 I think you ought to get yourself a new job. Every time the lion growls, you wind up with a corpse someplace and somebody has to ask you questions. That wasn't my idea, Sally. I might have to book you on technical charge. Oh, stop it, will you? 
You know I didn't have anything to do with him getting now, shot. Now, the next car named Pete Berger gets topped off just before a private dick gets around asking him a few questions, I got asked a private dick some questions myself, or else the chief is going to ask me some questions. Make sense? All I know is that somebody's been shooting at a client of mine. Mm-hmm. And that somebody's Pete Berger. How do you know? The bullets came from a gun owned by Pete Berger, so I came down to see him. Only he walks out all loaded down with 45 slugs and dies before you can say hello. Isn't that the bump? Who's your client, Regan? Do I have to tell you? No, but you will. Uh-uh. Company policy. Company policy. Confidence in a client, Regan. Can you arrest me for anything? Depends. Material witness, maybe. Yeah. While it's depending, I'll get a hold of the lion, he'll get a hold of Harry Presidio, and then I'll bet you ten bucks there'll be a writ of habeas corpus at the station by the time you get me there. All right, all right, all right, you're clear. This is a murder case, Regan. That's a serious crime in anybody's town. I don't know any more than I just told you, Sal. You know the name of your client? Okay. Okay. Why was Pete shooting at him? That's what I was going to ask Pete. Oh, now just exactly where does that put us? My client's safe and sound in his home, and Joe Canto's keeping an eye on him. When Canto was pounding a beat for the department, some guys got away from him. A lot of guys get away from a lot of cops, but not when the cop's watching. Canto's good at that. You know him. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But it's a thought. Well, it's no good. Before Pete Berger went to San Quentin, he was never very handy with a gun because his eyes were so bad he couldn't see his hand in front of his face. He didn't hit anything yesterday or today, but he was sure trying. Now, Flossie told me Pete's been playing stop man in pictures, making a buck at it. It seems he learned all his tricks while he was in the clink. They have a nice gym up there. They never tell what they'll do next. Still, can't understand why he'd all of a sudden go around shooting at somebody. You figure it, Sally. Unless maybe there was something personal and that Pete had to do it. And whoever people shooting, I got kind of sore. Turn around and plug Pete tonight, huh? My client's home, safe. Sure, sure. Cattle's good. Almost forgot. Pete Berger was a perfect setup for a wise guy. An ex-con who done 15 years, who learns his lesson, wants to make a straight dime, gets mad when anybody bothers. Blackmail. It's been done before. Pete had a good, healthy bank balance. I guess he was saving up for his old age. But some wise guy finds out Pete's a con, says, I'll tell your boss unless you kick in. Then maybe Pete starts shooting to scare him into shutting up. Make sense? Sounds like an old fairy tale, Sally. But screwy enough to be the answer. Only this wise guy Pete's shooting at thinks Pete might be mean in business. So he just comes over here tonight and plugs Pete. And who's the wise guy? Your client. John going to tell me his name? I can't involve a client in a murder. Oh, yeah, company policy. I almost forgot. Regan will find out in the morning. We got some lawyers, too. I know. Couldn't tell me now. I'll phone you in an hour, Sally. Okay. Okay, Regan, you can talk to him first. But phone me. Good night. Good night, Regan. See you around. My watch said four o'clock by the time I got to the hills back of Laurel Canyon and started up Mulholland Drive. The usual fog was in the usual places, doing the usual things to trees and houses. And when I pulled up in front of Max's house, one light was burning in the window. The rest of the house looked dark. Everything was quiet. The first thing I noticed was cordite. It smells black and it means that guns have been fired. The whole room was full of it. Max Vladney was lying half on the floor and half on the table he'd used for a workshop. A bottle of spirit gum was spilled on the floor along with some false blonde hair and a cracked wig block. He had one free arm around a white plaster cast of a head, just like it was a doll. There were two blue holes in the middle of his forehead. I just stood there looking at him when I heard a noise in back of me. It was Canto, and he was on the floor at the foot of the bed. Oh, no, don't try to move me, Regan. (coughs) I've been laying here waiting for you. It's in my lungs somewhere. I don't think I got any blood to spare. <laughs> Joey boy let you down, huh? It happened an hour after you left. I don't know who done it. There's a lot of noise in Max's room, and I come in, the next thing I know, I'm taking a slug myself. <laughs> Hey, hey, call me a doc, will you, Regan? I got a date tomorrow night. She's been trying to get rid of me. Does it give her a good excuse? 
guess Lionel will be mad, huh? Call me a Doc Regan right quick. <laughs> Well, I made a lot of phone calls before it was all over. Hollywood receiving hospital, Wendetti, central homicide, and I got the lion out of bed and told him what had happened. He said he'd meet me at the hospital. I hung around a while and talked to Wendetti. He didn't have much to say. When he got through poking around, he gave me a lift as far as the hospital. The lion was standing around the hall when I got there. It was the first time I'd ever seen him look tired. Hello, Regan. I just talked to the doctor. This is going to cost plenty. How bad is it? Twenty-five bucks a day for a room, plus surgery. No, I mean Canto. Oh. Well, bullet penetrated upper lobe of his right lung. Here, they pull this out. Forty-five slug. Who shoots forty-fives that good? Lots of people. Mm, same kind of people who go around killing Pete Berger and Max Vladney. Yeah. Canto getting himself shot's going to eat up every penny we might have made on this thing. Is money all you ever think of? What else is there to think about? If you got it, you're fine. If you haven't got it, you're nothing but a bum. One of your own men is lying in there wondering if he's ever going to live or die, and he took that slug because you sent him on the job. Everybody dies. I'll give him a citation. Oh, you big pile of blubber. I ought to push you out a window. Now, talk like that isn't going to help anything. No, but I know what Now, is. wait a minute, Regan. This is a police job. Oh, now it's a police job. Yeah, like I told you. And you can't go running around sticking your snoot into a couple of killings and giving International a lot of bad publicity. Now, get this, Fatso. I'm going out and find the guy who plugged Canto. Now, you listen to me. I want it down in the books and the papers and any place else that an international operator brought in the guy who killed one of their clients and shot one of their men. I won't be responsible for anything that happens. Okay, if you don't like the way I do things, you can pull my license right off the wall and get yourself another boy. Hey, hey, where are you going? Come back! Well, Mr. Regan... When I saw you at Max's yesterday afternoon, I didn't think you'd come by for that drink at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, come in, come in. I was just having coffee. I have to be at the studio for an early makeup job. You look all right to me, the way you are. Well, you can be nice. Will you have some coffee? No, thanks. Oh? I just stopped by for a minute. I'm afraid I have some tough news for you. Max. Something happened to Max. He's dead. Oh, no. Not Max. Somebody shot him three hours ago. Why would anyone want to kill Max? That's what I'm going to find out. Max expected me to marry him. So many plans. What can I do to help, Mr. Regan? What can I do? All right, now, look. A smart cop named Wendetti is going to be knocking on your door pretty soon. He's going to ask you a lot of questions about Max. Give me the answers first. Would you mind terribly if we sat down? I... Max was all I had. I, I want to be near someone. Sure. I know I'm acting silly about this. What is it I can tell you, Mr. Regan? Did Max ever mention a man named Pete Berger? No. I've never heard that name before. Well, he worked at the same studio. He was the one that shot at Max yesterday afternoon. And he killed Max? No. He's dead, too. He was shot to death an hour earlier I was there. I'm not very good at this kind of thing. What are you trying to tell me, Mr. Regan? Both of these killings were done by an amateur. They're not very good jobs. But there had to be some reason. I... I don't know. I've been in the business a long time, lady. Too long. People kill for money or love or just for the crazy feel of blasting a gun at somebody. This has been a lot for you. You know, if you find a reason, you find a killer. What kind of work would a makeup man be doing at home? I don't know. Max always tried to improve his work. I suppose that's why he made the money he did. He might have made a plaster cast of a head so he could study a face? I suppose so. Yes. Your face? Yes, I suppose so. Why? Well, it's a nice face. I've seen it in pictures. Most press agents think my hair is nice hair. Yeah, it is. Long, golden hair. Does it feel soft and warm? The way you hoped it would feel? Yeah, it does. And my lips? I don't feel bad doing this. I never did love Max. I was indebted to him. 
I was terribly ill several years ago. He helped me. I can see why he felt the way he did about you. Can you? I like the way you did that. I know what Max had been working on. It was something for you. Really? He was holding a plaster cast of your head in his arms when I found him. Of course, there was no hair on it, and it looked kind of funny. Don't say that! Don't ever say a thing like that! Yeah, now I got it. What are you talking about? Murder lady, lots of it. You killed a poor ex-con because he bungled a job you blackmailed him into doing. You shot him last night because I was going to talk to him. Are you crazy? Why would I do a thing like that? Then you went over and you killed Max. And while you are at it, you pumped the slugger two into Joe Cannell. You there's got to be a reason. Every newspaper in the country is going to carry this story, lady. Oh, yeah. Hilda Graham, the one with all the long golden hair, is really as bald as a fresh air. Shut up! Shut up! Don't you ever say anything like that in front of me? Why are you... Go ahead, lady. Pick up that paperweight and I'll break you in two. Now, come on. Let's go. No. Oh, no, you can't. You mustn't find out about my hair. Please, please don't tell them about my hair. I couldn't stand that. I... Oh, please, please, you know how nice I can be. <laughs> Lady, you're a bum. <laughs> Max had been trying to get her to marry him, and she didn't want to marry anybody, so she killed him. The police stenographer scratched his head on that one until I explained it was her hair, that long golden hair. Only it wasn't hers. It was a wig that Max had fixed up for her. She'd lost all hers when she was sick and couldn't stand the thought of anybody going around knowing it wasn't her own. Well, I guess you run into all kinds. A couple of days later, I saw Canto at the hospital. He'd had some transfusions and a lot of other things. He's coming along fine. I was reading a paper when I walked in. Oh, Ray. But what is what, huh? Hi, Joe. I've been reading about that Hilda Graham. Too bad they don't take her picture without all that pretty hair. It'd serve a ride. Yeah. How you feeling? Peachy. Now, Regan, how long we been working for the line? Too long. How many people been killed and messed up in that time that me and you know about personally? Too many. Hmm. There's one thing I can't get through my noodles. Why don't we get some other kind of a job? Real estate or movie extras or something. Why do we do it? Why do we do it, Jeff? I don't know, Joe. I don't know. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan, with Wilms Herbert as that Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS same time next week for Trouble, Suspense, and Thrilling Adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. The role of Max Vladney was played by Hans Conried with Barton Yarborough as Joe Canto. Betty Lou Gerson was Hilda Graham. Jack Crucian was Wendetti. Marlo Dwyer was Flossie. Jeff Regan, Investigator is written by E. Jack Newman, produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with special music by Del Castillo. This program came to you from Hollywood. Bob Lamont speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Radio England. Tsar Nicholas I of Russia devised one of the craziest and, in a sense, cruelest military drills ever known. It was called the Water Drill and was designed to perfect a crisp marching style. The drill consisted of a soldier who practiced goose stepping while carrying a glass of water on top of his military hat. If the Russian soldier spilled as much as a single drop, he was obliged to serve an additional year for every drop of water he spilled. Believe it or not. Murphy rang his bank manager and said, I've lost me checkbook, but don't worry, they're no good to anybody. I signed them all. Radio England, you play one. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of death. Yes, here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, 
a dictionary, a stenographer's notebook, a clothes hanger. All are touched by murder. Here's a postcard. It's a familiar object, slightly soiled in its passage through the mails. Usual cancellation over the stamp, no ordinary address, 29 St. Paul's Road, London. The message? Oh, yes. On the message side, a drawing, rather well done. Of the rising sun. Rather a conventional representation, isn't it, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Conventional, still a rather unconventional matter. Murder? Yes. Yes, it is unconventional. You know, Sergeant, I've often wondered why they held so many executions at sunrise. Why they end lives at the beginning of the day. Anyway, that postcard today with the rising sun on it can be seen among the other exhibits in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. Starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Yes, here lies death in a variety of forms, swift or slow, merciful or cruel, death is here, laid out, remembered in detail, and perhaps waiting to strike again. Here's a typewriter. This is an instrument of death. Yes? Worthy of the Black Museum, definitely. The criminal care, the vicious planning that went into its use, till the person who received the letters written on this machine, in desperation, took her own life. There's a child's toy, a tiny metal aeroplane. It's rusty in places. The propeller doesn't turn anymore, but there were fingerprints on this. They placed a killer at the scene of the crime, for which he was hanged. Now, here we are, the postcard. The postcard with its drawing of a rising sun. It's clear at once that a skilled hand drew this tiny picture. In this case, many things were clear almost at once, and conclusions were drawn... However, that, of course, is the story. The story which begins for us as Alfie Vine and his elderly mother turn into the entrance of 29 St. Paul's Road, London. Alfie, I refuse to go a step further until you've told me what this is all about. I'm surprising you, Mums. Oh, you've come all this way. Are you going to spoil it all now? I'll not set foot in this house until you stop all this mystery. Oh, Mums. Well, this is where I've got my rooms. Your Living here? Oh, 29 St. Paul's. You know the address. It's rather dirty. My place is all right. It's only the outside, and it's cheap. Alfie, you've not wanted to show me this before. I want to show you the girl who's waiting upstairs. Alfie, you haven't gone and got married. Not yet, Mums, but we're planning, so I want you to meet her. All right, I'll go in. They went in. The shabby young man, the rusty, black-clad, grey-haired woman. 
They climbed the stairs, one flight only, only one, but enough for Mrs. Vine to see the scabby walls, the dirty stair rail, the untidy hall. Alfred placed his key in the lock and turned it and opened the door. Light from the window revealed a single room, a washstand, a bed. The mother had reason to scream. There was a young lady on the bed, clad in the remnants of a nightgown. The gown, the sheets, the pillow were bloodstained. Why wouldn't they be? The young lady's head had been severed from her body. His mother, given into the care of a neighbor, Alfie Vine summoned the police. Shortly thereafter, he faced Inspector Wood and Sergeant Cross of the CID, Scotland Yard. It's obvious, Vine, that this Alice Cortland was, uh, or should we say, more than a fiancé to you. We was married. I didn't want my mother to think we'd gone and done it without her knowing, so we planned to do it over again after Mum's met her. Yeah. Where were you last night, Vine? Working. Oh, you can check. I'm a postal clerk. Night shift. Where? Charing Cross substation. Oh, check that, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Of course. You work nights a lot, Vine. It's a split schedule, Inspector. Two or three times, sometimes more a week. You don't think I'd done Alice in, do you? We're not thinking anything yet. Not until we find out from the lab exactly when she died. Poor Alice. She didn't have much of a life. Nothing to depend on till she met me. What did she do at night while you were working? I never asked. We trusted each other, we did. I see. Sergeant, I want the neighborhood... The inspector was skeptical. You could hear it in his voice. The story was odd, to say the least. It became a trifle more odd when Sergeant Cross reported... They knew her, all right. Every bar in the district, but not as Alice Vine. In most places, she was Daisy Cummins. Spectre understood. It came as no surprise, therefore, when a frightened little man, a Marty Shaw, ship's cook on leave, turned up at the yard. Yes, sir, I knew Daisy, but I wasn't with her Wednesday night. No, sir, not then. Uh, when did you see her last? That was Tuesday night, Inspector. And uh, before that? Monday, uh, and Sunday too, sir. We had dates, Daisy and me, whenever I was ashore. Always had a few drinks together uh, at the York, at the Rising Sun. Uh, places like that along St Paul's Road. Mm -hmm. But not Wednesday night? No, sir. Not the night she got herself killed. No, sir. Why not? Well, she had a date with somebody else, sir. Oh, how do you know? Well, I saw him, sir. In the rising sun. I, I saw him. Mm -hmm. Were you jealous? <laughs> no, sir. I was with Daisy's friend Margie. Good looker, too. Can you describe the man Daisy was with? Well, I had a look at him. I, I believe I could. Oh, could you pick him out of a group? Well, I might, sir. I'd try for you, Inspector. I'd really try. Apparently, a step forward is about to be made in the case... The ship's cook gives his description. Not very big. Slim-like, too. Shabby, but in a genteel kind of way. About 30 years old. Always doodling-like with a pencil. Kind of fella can always pick up a check. A description. Not much to go on, but a start. Again, the canvases covered the area. And now the various barmaids and tavern keepers remembered a man like that. Remembered seeing a man like that with Daisy, alias Alice. The girl who literally lost her head. However, there were no further traces of the man in question. Inspector Wood and Sergeant Cross went back to the bedroom in St. Paul's Road. All right, Sergeant. With a fine tooth comb. The whole room down to the baseboards. And behind them, if necessary. The detectives took the tawdry little room apart. The bed was dismantled. The window shades were unrolled. The washstand and its pipings were completely explored. The bureau was investigated. The drawers were pulled out. Their contents tossed on the bed. Hello... Here's something, Inspector. Ah, a postcard, I see. Postmarked the day before. Where was it? Caught in the back of this drawer, between the backboard and the bottom. Yeah, interesting. What do you make of that drawing, Sergeant? It looks like the old Jap flag to me. I don't know of any Japanese eating place near here, Inspector. Dear Daisy, meet me at 8.15 at the... whatever the picture means. It's a rising sun, isn't it, Sergeant? And there is a rising sun. Well, that Shaw fellow saw her on Wednesday night. Yeah, rather well drawn, almost a skilled hand. An artist, maybe? Maybe. Possibly the killer as well. Right, back to work, Sergeant. There may be a few more little messages like this. They found two more, hidden in the recesses at the back of the bureau. And that was all. It's a thousand to one shot, Sergeant, but we'll try publishing these in the papers. Someone may recognize the handwriting or the sketches. More likely, the sketches. And someone did. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello? Larry? This is May. May? This is wonderful. Is it, Larry? Of course it is. Then why haven't I heard from you in weeks? <laughs> After we had our quarrel, dear, I, I thought a certain beautiful model was pretty well through with a certain artist. I should be. But you're not. Larry, have you seen today's newspapers? No. Why? It's quite simple. A girl you'd been sending postcards to was murdered Wednesday night. How? How do you know I sent her cards? They're in the paper with drawings. I know your style. Even in the paper. <laughs> I, I, I should be flattered, I guess. I'm not. Larry, the police want to know who sent those cards. May, will you believe me when I tell you I never killed anyone? I believe you. I know you. Then, for old time's sake, will you help me? I'm in trouble, May. Real trouble. What would you want me to do, Harry? If anyone asks you, anyone at all, will you say we were together from 10.30 on on Wednesday night? For how long? Oh, an hour or so. Then you went to Earl's Court and I went to King's Cross. Will you? Were you with her? Does, does it matter, May? No, not anymore, I suppose. Then try to remember, May, please. 10.30, Earl's Court, King's Cross. <laughs> May Hester, artist model, once upon a time in love with an artist named Larry, and now asked to provide an alibi. In fact, asked to provide an alibi which might never be needed. May Hester lived with what she knew for a day or so, and then, half reluctantly, her feet and her conscience took her to an office in the old building on the Thames. I understand your position, Miss Hester. I'm grateful you came to see me. I, I don't believe he killed her, Inspector, but as long as you're looking for him... You won't be looking for the right person, will you? Well, that's one way of saying it. Uh, Miss Hester. Yes, Inspector? I think you'd better give me his name. It, it's Larry Duncan. Mm -hmm. Do you know where he lives at present? May Hester knew. She gave Inspector Wood an address on London's western edge. She left the environs of Scotland Yard. So did Inspector Wood in company with Sergeant Cross. Mr. Duncan? Yes, I'm Duncan. I'm Inspector Wood, CID. Uh, my credentials. This is Sergeant Cross. Uh, will you come in, gentlemen? No, thank you. I'm afraid, Mr. Duncan, we have to ask you to come out with us. We need to ask you a few questions. And it'll be more convenient down at the yard. Well, today the host guard, with a little picture of the rising sun on it, is part of the exhibits in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Larry Duncan was held on suspicion of murder. The inspector was convinced of his guilt. Duncan protested his innocence. The family called in a famous defender, but despite the presence in the case of Sir John Cripps, Scotland Yard charged Larry Duncan with the murder of Alice Vine alias Daisy Cummins, and preparations for the trial went forward. Sir John conferred with Larry. How are you, my boy? Fairly well, sir. 
D does my prison pallor show as yet? Not yet. I like your confidence, Larry. I didn't kill the woman, sir. However, you were seen with her that night. A man, a sailor, I believe, who had been with her the three nights previous, saw you both together in the um, rising sun. That's... That's why I asked May to say we'd been together after 10.30 that night. Well, they have another witness, a tram conductor, who states he saw you leave that house at five in the morning. He couldn't have seen me. I take your word. But will a jury after that false alibi? <laughs> I'll have to take my chances on that, I guess. Well, we'll see. Perhaps a little further investigation may bring a few more facts to light. Sir John Cripps proceeded toward a few more facts. But he kept what he learned very quiet. Not until the trial itself did he reveal his strategy, nor the evidence he expected to produce. In fact, the first move came sometime after Inspector Wood and Sergeant Cross had placed the police case in the record. The tram conductor, one Charles Powers, was on the witness stand. And are you certain, Mr. Powers, that the prisoner in the dock is the man you saw leaving 29 St. Paul's Road that morning? I am that, sir. Positive. How, Mr. Powers? By his walk, sir. He has a kind of a free swing in stride. Thank you. Uh, you may cross-examine. Thank you. Mr. Powers, let me refresh my memory. You have said the weather that tragic morning was drizzly. Yeah, I did say so. It was. Thank you. And that you saw the man quite clearly by the light of a lamppost. Yes, sir. That's correct. And further, that you heard a church clock in the vicinity strike five. I did. My lord, I offer in evidence as a rebuttal of this man's testimony the reports duly attested of the electric light company servicing that district which contains the record that the street lights were extinguished that morning at 4.37 a.m. This man could not have seen anyone by the light of a street lamp. Mark it for evidence. And if it please the court, I have here the duly attested records of the London Weather Bureau. Not one drop of rain fell anywhere in London that morning. Mark that for evidence. Thank you, my lord. A skilled lawyer in action is a fine thing to watch, isn't it? Here was a witness, an important witness, completely demolished. His facts called in question and his responsibility torn to pieces. The prosecution suffered from that, naturally. They attempted to regain their loss with Marty Shaw, the ship's cook. In conclusion, Mr. Shaw, you identified the prisoner as the man who was with the victim the night of the murder? I did, sir. Thank you. Uh, your witness. Thank you. Mr. Shaw... Were you frightened when you heard of Miss Cummins' death? No. Why should I be? Why shouldn't you have been? After all, Mr. Shaw, by your own testimony, you spent Sunday, Monday and Tuesday evenings with Miss Cummings. She was killed on Wednesday. Why shouldn't you have been frightened? You mean because I was the next man to the prisoner? Next man to the murderer, perhaps. Not next man to the prisoner. Maybe I was. You realised, didn't you, that your position might turn out to be unpleasant? Yes, I, I guess I did. And you discussed the matter with another lady friend of the deceased? What if I did? Nothing. Nothing at all. Except, perhaps, that from this woman you obtained a detailed description of a certain friend of Miss Cummings, and from that description you picked out the prisoner at an identification parade? Well, Mr. Shaw, answer me. Uh, well, Speak up, Mr. Shaw. The judge and the jury want to hear your answer. So do I. Yes, sir. I did that. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. That is all. Another witness's testimony discredited. His motives called in question. The propriety of his identification more than called in question. The courtroom crowd was making bets as it filed out after the first day. The odds were swinging away from the prosecution and toward the young man who sat quietly in the prisoner's dock, sketching, sketching. After all, Larry Duncan was an artist, but an artist wants to keep the record of his experiences, even when his life hangs in the balance. Next day, the prosecution called May Hester. Miss Hester, um, how did you learn of this crime? In the newspapers. And how did you first connect the prisoner with it, uh, in your mind? Well, when I saw the postcard in the paper, the one with the drawing on it, 
It was Larry's, Mr. Duncan's style. I recognised it. What did you do? I called him on the phone. What happened? He asked me to give him an alibi. A false alibi? Yes. He wanted me to say that I'd been with him that night. And what did you do? I agreed. Then I thought it over and I went to the police. Very well, Miss Hester. Uh, thank you. Uh, Cross-examine. Uh, Miss Hester, why did you go to the police? Well, I, I was afraid, I suppose. Had you been in love with Mr. Duncan? I... that is... yes. Uh-huh. Was he in love with you? I thought so. Have you ever heard of an emotion called jealousy, Miss Hester? It was over. I had no reason to be jealous. I submit, Miss Hester, that when you thought it over, when you realized that Mr. Duncan had apparently gone to this woman after his protestations to you, that you were not afraid, that you were jealous enough to want revenge... That's not so. That's not true. You were afraid. Of what? That this man might try to murder you? No, of course not. Larry, Mr. Duncan couldn't... wouldn't hurt a fly. Miss Hester... When Mr. Duncan asked you for the alibi, did you know the time of the murder? No. No, sir. When did you learn of it? Here, in the medical testimony. Did the question of the time of the death enter your mind when you went to the police? No. No, of course not. I ask you again, Miss Hester. Can you say you were motivated only by fear and not by jealousy or revenge? Yes. Yes. I was only afraid. Afraid of what? I was afraid that, well, even if he hadn't done it and, and I... I had, had to swear falsely. I might get into trouble myself. And you were willing to sacrifice the reputation, perhaps even the life of the man you loved, because you were afraid to get into trouble. Objection, my lord. Irrelevant, incompetent, and immaterial. I withdraw the question. That is all, Miss Hester. Thank you very much. Thereafter, the prosecution rested their case, or what was left of it. Sir John called Larry Duncan as his first witness for the defense. Testimony was short. I didn't kill her. I left her at the rising sun that night, around midnight. I didn't kill her. Nor could the Crown's prosecutor shake his statement. Next and last witness for the defense, one David Wallace, a ticket agent on a suburban railroad. Mr. Wallace, what is your address? 26 St. Paul's Road. What time did you leave your house the morning after this killing? My regular time, sir. Five minutes to five. Uh-huh. Did you see anyone that morning? Yes, sir. A man going in the opposite direction. Only one man? Only one, sir. Are you conscious that you have a rather free-swinging stride? Oh, I do it on purpose, sir. It's good for you in the morning. Uh, with the permission of the court, I request a small demonstration. Proceed. Step down a moment, Mr. Wallace, please. Aye, sir. Uh, now then, uh, just turn up the collar of your coat. Ah, thank you. Uh, put on your hat, will you? Thank you. Now, um, will you walk, please, as you do in the mornings? Uh, chest out, uh, breathe deep and all. Please, like this, sir. It was unmistakable, the free-swinging stride. It was established that there was a man on proper, decent business walking in St. Paul's Road at five that morning. The prosecution had no cross-examination for Mr. Wallace. The Crown summed up. Sir John summed up. The judge's charge was brief and to the point. In cases such as this, if there is any reasonable doubt in your minds, gentlemen of the jury, it is incumbent on you to give the prisoner the benefit of that doubt. At 8.30 the same evening, the jury filed back into the box. The clerk solemnly intoned the old question. Have you reached a verdict? We have. Again, the clerk spoke. What is your verdict? We find the accused not guilty. <laughs> Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Thank <laughs> you.
Postcard, whatever it may mean with its rising sun, reposes in a place of honor in the Black Museum. Radio England, you play one, 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 one. Beautiful, aren't they? Big eaters, too. But they don't get the most expensive cans. They're fed chunky mince morsels. Why? Well, take away the water from both and see. Mince morsels has more solid food than the most expensive large can. Good and nourishing for even the biggest dogs. Nice and moist, too. We recommend chunky mince morsels. More solid nourishment than the most expensive large can. George Walker, who worked on a farm not far from where Johannesburg stands today, was on his way to church one Sunday morning in March 1886 when he stumbled over a piece of protruding rock covered by grass. He knelt down to remove the cause of trouble and discovered the main reef conglomerate containing $10 billion worth of gold. Although he stumbled over the richest gold field in the world, Walker died in poverty, believe it or not. Radio England, you say one made me first suspect Joe was that he knew more than any innocent person should have known. I suspected Irene the moment I heard the fireman's testimony. The apparently unimportant fact. I suspected, I suspected, the, suspected the postman after he... I suspected. I suspected. I suspected. I suspected. Listen to radio's newest, most interesting and thrilling program, Suspicion. Suspicion. Somewhere in the drama about to be presented is a seemingly unimportant fact, a hidden clue that first casts suspicion on the ultimate culprit. Listen regularly to this thrilling series. Test your powers of observation and deduction and find the hidden clue. It may be a single line, a sound, perhaps a complete scene. All names and characters depicted in this story are fictitious. Any resemblance to persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. In the story we presented last time in this series... Kidnappers, do you remember this scene? Henry Montrose, suspected of kidnapping Homer Welch, has been identified by Mrs. Martha Jones, who saw him, so she said, plain as day. There was a full moon on the night she saw him crossing a field near the kidnapper's hideout. And when Detective Westley went to bring her to Montrose's trial... Mrs. Jones? Mrs. Jones? It's me, Mr. Westley. Oh, I didn't see you good at first. I thought maybe the other kidnappers was coming after me. Whenever someone knocks on the door, I stand by the wall here and study them for a minute. The hidden clue, ladies and gentlemen, was that Martha Jones had poor eyesight. She claimed to have seen Henry Montrose by moonlight when he was 200 feet away. Yet, she had to carefully study Detective Westley standing only a few feet away before she recognized him. Now we present The Spider. London, England, at 9 o'clock one Saturday night in August. In the basement of the recently built Lambeth branch of the Colony Bank, a faint line, then a crack appears in the concrete floor and swiftly widens until... Stand back, Grace. As soon as I'm out, step on the block of cement and I'll give you a hand up. Right, I'll find it. All right, give me your hand. Quick. Easy there, does it? Uh, oh, there. Oh, it was hot in the tunnel. Quiet. Pass up the tool, dirt. 
Be careful with the oxygen tank. You better see. Someone's coming. Uh, hide behind the packing box. All right. I'll get him. Up with your hands. Oh, I guess it's me imagination. Still, perhaps I'd better look around a bit. Yes, it's just me. Blimey. Where'd that hole in the floor? Oh. <laughs> well, he saved us the bother of looking for him. Yeah. Now, Grace, see that his signals are turned in regularly. Here's where each alarm box is located. And here's a key. All right. Hurry with the tools, Dirk. We've got to finish and get out of here before dawn. <laughs> Well, Inspector Davis, the watchman is a total loss as far as information goes. When he came to, his eyes and mouth were covered with adhesive tape and... But didn't he hear anything, McGraw? He claims to have heard a woman address somebody as Spider. Mm. Someone's trying to be sensational. Uh, but he's still so nervous and rattled that he doesn't know what he's saying. I see. Are there any clues here in the cellar? Well, if you mean fingerprints, no. Apparently, they wore gloves. However, the job itself is a clue. Huh? How long is it since this building was finished, McGraw? Five weeks. Oh, but I say, I, I think I see your point. They broke through the thinnest part of the floor because they knew the plans of the building. Right. And if you care to mess around in the tunnel, you'll see that they knew the exact depth of the foundations. Either they'd watched the building operations very closely or they had the plans. Now, here's how we'll work. You question the people around here, McGraw, and see if they remember persons taking undue interest in the building of the bank. I'll check with the contractors to find out if any plans were taken. We'll start at once. <laughs> well, good morning, Inspector, and what can I do for you? I understand you were one of the contractors of the Lambeth branch of the Colony Bank. That's right. I installed the plumbing. Are any of your plans missing? <laughs> well, the, the bank officials could tell you that, Inspector. They have all my plans and specifications. And I doubt if they were copied. You see, on work of that nature, I personally supervise my men. I never allow the plans out of my sight. Would you like me to go with you this morning, McGraw? I've reached a dead end on my line of investigation. I'm afraid I have too, Davis. I've questioned everybody in that end of Lambeth. And you've questioned the architects, contractors, and bankers, but no one remembers any person taking unusual interest in the building of the bank. Either they don't or won't remember. No, they'd speak up if they knew anything. Don't forget the reward offered. Then I'm afraid we'll have to try a new line of inquiry. Davis speaking. What's that? Put him on the wire. Hello, Mr. Dawson. This is Chief Inspector Davis. I understand you know something about this bank robber, the spider. Oh, your place, eh? I see. Yes? Yes, I'll be over there in about 15 minutes. Right. I've been a fool, McGraw. That was Gregory Dawson, the architect. He designed the bank. His office was entered and ransacked last night. You get the watchman and bring him to me as soon as I get in touch with him. Mr. Dawson? Yes. Oh, hello, Inspector. Come in. Perhaps I'm entirely mistaken, but I'd like you to hear what Milton Andrews has to say. Andrews is one of my clerks. I see. Well, Andrews? Well, it's this way, Inspector. I was working late last night, and it must have been ten o'clock, I guess, when I heard, or thought I heard, somebody at the outer door. And thinking it might be Mr. Dawson or Jerry Grenshaw, I, I opened the door. No one was there. I stepped into the hall, then turned around, and... And that's the last thing I remember. I came down early this morning, Inspector, and found Andrews jammed into the closet over there. What with the bump on his head and being shut in the closet for 12 hours, he was barely conscious. Mm -hmm. And who is this Jerry Grenshaw? He's my other clerk. He's been here about three months. He had references, of course. Uh, do you know just what was stolen, Mr. Dawson? Yes. That's why I wanted to speak to you, Inspector. I've been working on some plans for a bank in Mayfair. The rough drafts are missing. Hmm. And when does Grenshaw usually report for work? I expect him any minute. He's half an hour late as it is. Would you mind phoning and... Yes, certainly. If... I'll be back in a moment. Now, Andrews, did you hear any voices while you were locked in the closet? No, sir. That is, I heard just a mumble. I think one voice was a woman's, but I'm not positive. And they left a minute or so after I regained consciousness. I see. But did the voice sound in any way familiar? 
know. What sort of a man is Grenshaw? Well, if you think he did it, sir, you're quite mistaken. Grenshaw is not a criminal type. There's no such thing as a criminal type, Andrews. Some of the men I've sent to prison look just as respectable as you and Mr. Dawson. Is Grenshaw tall or He is there, Inspector. Grenshaw? Yes. The landlady said he came in shortly after 10 o'clock last night. Packed a suitcase and... Come on. And on the way over to his place, I want you two to tell me everything you know about him. Everything, even what kind of food he likes. This is the place, Inspector. He had the corner room on the third floor. Well, I'll do all the talking, if you don't mind. Good morning. Good morning. What time did Mr. Grenshaw leave last night? I'm from Scotland Yard. Oh, so he's wanted by the police, is he? Well, last night, a few minutes after ten, he come here, packed his suitcase, and went right out. I seen him get into a yellow touring car. Uh, there was a woman driving it. Did he say where he was going? No, he just came in and left, sir. But I found this in his room this morning, I did. Hmm, let's see. Golden Swan Inn, Teffingham. I know the place, Inspector. It's a rather cheap hotel near Hastings and South Downs. I made the plans for a bank in Hastings not more than eight months ago. Good Lord, do you think that he's... If he's not the spider, he'll lead us to him. Come on, I'll need you to as well. There's the golden swan, Inspector. Right. Oh, before making a formal arrest, I have to check with the local constable. Also, if Grenshaw should see you two, he might try to get away. There he is, Inspector, in the garden, by the end of the hedge. Yes, sir, that's Grenshaw, all right. And there's the woman who went to the office with him. Good. We'll sneak up along the other side of the hedge and listen to him. Come on. Didn't you hear an automobile just drive up, Miss Tolliver? Yes, but it's too early for him. He won't be here until much later in the day. Well, then I could have given him the papers in town. I really know nothing about it, Mr. Grenshaw. Well, haven't you any idea why Mr. Dawson wanted me to bring the plans here? <laughs> when you've known him as long as I have, Mr. Grenshaw... Just you'll... the same, I don't like it. He doesn't usually do things this way. No, I'm afraid he doesn't, Grenshaw. And who are you? Chief Inspector Davis of Scotland Yard. You're both under arrest, and anything you say may be used against you. Say, what's the big idea? You're under arrest for burglary with assault. Milton Andrews just identified both of you as the people who entered Mr. Dawson's office last night. That's a lie. I wasn't near the office last night. No? And neither was Miss Tolliver. Then where did you get that envelope in your pocket, Grenshaw? It's marked private inspector and was in my desk when I closed the office last night. He left before I did. Miss Tolliver gave it to me. Huh? And she got it from Mr. Dawson. He's her uncle. I'm her what? Well, I never saw the woman before in my life, Inspector. Good Lord, if you're trying to rope me into this uh, this pack of lies, I'll... Now, take it easy, Dawson. I'll identify that envelope as being stolen from my office, Inspector. Very well, then I'll and arrest you. Oh. Ah, so you remember the mistake you made, eh, Andrews? Well, Miss Tolliver, what's your story? Oh, I'll give evidence for the Crown, Inspector. Me and Andrews, only we call him the Spider, robbed the Colony Bank Saturday. Well, what about last night? Oh, I went to Mr. Dawson's office... Andrews gave me the plans of a bank in Hastings and one in Mayfair. And I hit him over the head and shoved him in the closet. I see. And how did Grenshaw figure on your plans? Grenshaw? He was just a poor sap who fell for a pretty face and believed everything I told him. While driving back to London... I... I guess I was pretty much of a poor sap, Inspector. Don't forget it, Grenshaw. When she told you she was Mr. Dawson's niece and that he wanted you for some confidential work, well, the average man would probably have done just as you did. Evidently, Andrews, or the spider, thought he'd be clever by faking the robbery. But he was too clever for his own good. But frankly, I didn't suspect him until... Ladies and gentlemen, did you discover the hidden clue that caused Chief Inspector Davis of Scotland Yard to suspect Milton Andrews? Right into this station and tell us the hidden clue you found. And to test your powers of observation and deduction... Listen for the correct hidden clue in this story the next time we present Suspicion.
England, you, 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 K, 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 one, 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 one. The oldest language in the world isn't spoken between one man and another. It's spoken between man and the elephant. It's the language of the Indian Mahout, the professional elephant driver. In addressing the elephant, the Mahout uses neither Hindi nor Arabic nor Persian, three of the oldest still spoken languages. Rather, he speaks to his elephant in the language of the caveman, with which the first elephant was trained 50,000 years ago. Believe it or not. <laughs> Sally's leave their alleys in the city lights to stray. But this little ray of sunshine, she isn't built that way. Just another Sally living down another alley, and she's just as sweet and pally as the Sally of old. Her smile is like the sunshine And the one, the only one smile in the world That turns the alleys gray to gold To a little church on Sunday Where to find rain or shine, off she goes Then back to work again on Monday in her plain little work a day clothes, we love her just another Sally living down another alley and I'd give the world if she belonged to me. What do you think of that, lady? Haven't I proof? And how? Now get a load of this. That's it. Fine rain or shine, off she goes. Then back to work again on Monday in her plain little workaday clothes. We love her just another Sally living down another alley, and I'd give the world if she belonged to me. Radio England, you, 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 K, 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 one, 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 one. have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. You get a call from a man who tells you his wife has failed to keep an appointment. There's no trace of her. There's evidence of foul play. Your job? Find her. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Friday, August 7th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from missing persons, and it was 1.27 a.m. when I got back to room 42. Homicide squad room. 
Hi, Joe. You talked to Graham? Yeah, he just got in. How'd they do? Well, they came up with a kid. Where'd they find him? The boyfriends. They were watching TV. The missing youngster had told his friend his mother knew he was there. Uh-huh. Everything's all right then, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Graham said the kid's going to have to eat standing up for a few days. You know, it's a funny thing about parents. What do you mean? A thing like this happens, and all they care about is getting their kids back. Uh-huh. After a while, they begin to think about it and get sore. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, you figured you got a couple of kids. Yeah, I guess it'd be the same way. I got it. Homicide Friday. Guess her, that's right. Well, where were you supposed to meet her? Well, have you checked there? Let's see. All right, you want to give me that address? Yes, sir. No, we'll be right out. Right. Goodbye, sir. I already got one we better check here. Yeah? Bartender out of Normandy. Says his wife was supposed to meet him a half hour ago and she hasn't shown up. He called his house? Yeah, she's not there either. Says she's never been late before. Yeah, it's always the first time. Well, he doesn't think so. Huh? He thinks she's been kidnapped. <laughs> Frank and I left the office and drove over to the bar. It was located on the corner of Normandy Avenue and Monroe Street. In the event the story we'd gotten on the phone was true and the woman had been kidnapped, we parked the car down the street and I walked back to the place. A couple of minutes later, Frank followed. We met the man who'd placed the call, George Cabot. We asked him to tell us what was wrong. Sure didn't waste any time getting here. You want to tell us what's happened? Yeah, my wife's gone. How do you mean? Ethel's disappeared. Well, when did you see her last? This morning when I left the house. Have you talked to her since then? Yeah, at 12.55 tonight. She called here to tell me she was on the way down. Mm-hmm. Did she seem all right then? Yeah, as far as I could tell. Possible that she might have stopped at one of the neighbors? Well, I thought about that, too, but I checked. None of them have seen her. You called your home, Annie. Yeah, I didn't get any answer. I tell you, something's happened to Ethel. I'm about to blow my cork not knowing what it is. Well, maybe she's still at the house and didn't hear the phone ring. Yeah, I figured that, too. Maybe that's her. Hello, Ethel, what? No, this is Cabot's Bar and Grill. Yes, ma'am. Who? No, I didn't see him tonight. No, I'm sure. Yeah, I'd know him. No, lady, I'm not lying for him. He isn't here. Yeah, if I see him, I will. Yeah, good night. Wasn't her. No. Woman's in the same fix I'm in, only she can't find her husband. Cabot? Yes, sir. I hope you won't be offended by this, but does your wife drink? You mean you think she stopped at some barn, got gassed up, and just didn't show up? Is that what you mean? No, that's not exactly what I meant. I just asked if your wife drank. Well, you got it all wrong. Ethel has a martini once in a while before dinner, but if she wanted to drink any more than that, she could come down here and I'd pour for her. All right. It's a question we have to ask. You understand that? Just as long as you don't think that Ethel's a lush, because she is. You said you checked your house, huh? Yeah, when she didn't show up, I waited a while, and then I got worried and called Mrs. Lawrence. She's the lady next door. Mm -hmm. Ask her if she's seen Ethel. Yeah. She said my wife had been over there all evening. They were playing that baseball game, um, line drive, you know, with the cards. I don't think I know it. It's a new game. Anyway, they played that for a while, and then they watched the television, and at 12.30, Ethel said she had to come down and meet me. Mrs. Lawrence said she left the house then and drove away. Mm-hmm. His neighbor's kind of bubble-headed, you know. She's not real bright about things, so I thought that maybe Ethel had gotten sick and couldn't answer the phone when I called. Yeah. I called a cab and went home. The car was gone, so was Ethel. I checked the whole house in the yard. Not a sign of her. Looked in the front closet, too. Her coat was gone. I'm sure she'd left the house. Mm-hmm. I had the cab driver come back to the bar the same way that Ethel always drives it. I thought maybe there was an accident or something. If there was, I'd be able to see it. You know, people are cops. Yeah, I understand. Street. Wasn't anything. Does she always come down here at night? Regular as clockwork. Never misses. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah sure. Hello. Yeah. No, I remember. No, ma'am, I haven't seen it. Look, lady, I got my own troubles. I'm not trying to cover up for your husband. Well, it doesn't make any difference to me or not what you think. He isn't here. Okay, that's fine with me. He never ran up more than a 30-cent tab anyway. And even then, he ate all the peanuts on the bar, and you tell him I said so. Yeah, good night. <coughs> Real crackpot. You were saying that your wife made it a practice to come down here, is that right? That's right. You see, our boy was killed in the Pacific five years ago, our only kid. We both took it pretty hard. It got on Ethel's nerves sitting around the house by herself, so she drive down to pick me up. Get here a little early and help me with the cleanup. Yes, sir. Called at 12.55 to say she was leaving, walking the door at 1.05. Didn't vary more than a minute either way. Mm-hmm. Depend on the light at the corner of Denmore and Santa Monica. If she makes it green, it's 1.04 when she walks in. Otherwise, she's a minute later. Does she always call before she leaves the house? I can walk over to the phone at 5.01 and pick it up. I know she's going to be on the other end. Has your wife been in good mental spirits lately, do you know? How do you mean? Well, I mean, has there been anything on her mind? Anything that worried her more than usual? No, she didn't say anything. If there was, I'd have been able to tell. 
Is there any special reason why you think she's been kidnapped? Just that she's gone. It isn't like Ethel to do something like this. I know it's not her idea. Never done anything like this before, then? No. Mm-hmm. Do you have a picture of her we could have? You sure, I got one in my wallet. You're probably that woman again. Oh, well, look, I haven't seen you. What? Now, look, don't you try that with me. No, I don't. If you hurt her, I'll make you sorry the rest of your life. I... Hello? Hello? Cabot? Cabot? What? What's the matter? Nothing. I, I guess I made a mistake about the whole thing. What do you mean that? I guess nothing's happened to Ethel. Just forget I called you about it. Is that the way you want it? Yeah, I'm sorry to cause you all the trouble. I'd like to buy you a drink if I could. No, thanks. Sorry about the whole thing. You want to tell us what they said? Who? Party on the phone there. I don't want to talk about anything. You're not going to help your wife that way. Now, what did they ask for? Look, I told you guys it was all a mistake. Now, why not let it go at that? How about the picture you were going to give us? There's no reason for it. The whole thing's a goof up. Well, you're talking the phone didn't make it sound that way. All right, she's gone. Those are the people who have her. They asked for money? No. They said for me to sit tight and not to tell anybody or they'd kill Ethel. I'm going to do like they say. You're taking a big responsibility on yourself, Cabot. Maybe so, but she's my wife. This is a big city. It's going to be a little tough for us to find the kidnappers without your help. Not so bad. How do you mean that? I got an idea who they are. It isn't going to be too hard to find out. You go out on a limb and you may give your wife more trouble than help. Ethel's my wife. You're not going to let us help you then, huh? No, and I don't want to go over it anymore. I got the only stake in this anyway. Well, you're wrong about that. What? What about your wife? Because of his attitude, it was useless to question George Cabot any further. We left the bar and got in touch with the office. We made arrangements for a complete 24-hour surveillance to be kept on him. In most cases of this type, the kidnappers usually demand that the victim's friends or relatives stay away from law enforcement agencies. They do this to stall for time. Statistics prove that in the vast majority of cases, the victim's fate was decided long before the kidnapping occurred. It never is the intent of any officer to endanger the life of a kidnapped victim, but at the same time, it is necessary for them to have all available information so that they can move rapidly when the case does break. In an effort to gain more information on the missing woman, Frank and I went over to see the victim's next-door neighbor. She identified herself as Carol Lawrence and asked us into the house. I'm not sure this is quite proper, you know. What's that, Miss Lawrence? There's a couple of men in my house at this hour, especially with me in my bathrobe. Well, I'm sure the neighbors will understand. Oh, I hope so. A couple of real gabby ones from the street, you know. Mm-hmm. Big mouths. Yes, ma'am. I guess you being policeman, it's all right, you think? Yes, ma'am. Okay, then. Uh, what do you want to know? When did you see Miss Cabot last? You mean Ethel? That's right. Well, I saw her tonight. Why? What time did she leave? Well, I guess it was about 12.30. Say where she was going? You didn't have to. What do you mean? Well, Ethel only goes one place that time of night. Yeah. Down to pick up George. We understand she usually calls him before she leaves. That's right. I left here at 12.30, went next door to get a coat. A couple of minutes later, I heard her drive off. What can you tell us about her? Nice woman. Real nice. Yes, ma'am. We're great chums, you know. Belong to the same club and see a lot of each other. Mm-hmm. You see, my husband's gone, and Ethel's man works every night, so she's alone a lot of the time, too. I understand. Ever since their boy was killed, she's been kind of empty. How was that? Their boy was killed. Yes, she's ma'am. been kind of empty ever since. I see. Then, too, George don't help much. Well, what do you mean, my boy? Oh, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. Well, it's all right, ma'am. We... Oh, I sure don't want to get nobody in trouble. Well, you won't. Uh, you won't know it around that I told you anything. No, ma'am. How about you? No, ma'am. One thing I can't go is a person who carries tails. Just can't go. I don't want anybody to say that about me. Well, yes, ma'am. What is it you're going to say? I guess it'll be all right. You're so honest looking. Thank you. He is, too. Yes, ma'am. What would you like to tell us? Well, you know, poor Ethel isn't very happy. Is that so? Oh, my. I feel so sorry for her sometimes. What about? Well, it's that husband of hers. Mr. Callis? Yeah. Oh, he's a good provider and all, but I always say there's more to life than just that. Yes, ma'am. Nice home, good car, paid bills and all, but George isn't the fellow he makes out, you know. That's so? Why do you think Ethel goes down to that bar to pick him up every night? Well, we don't know. Why don't you tell us? You're a man. You should be able to figure it out. She doesn't trust him. That's why. Uh-huh. All those girls hanging around the bar. Ethel notices things like that. George has got pretty big eyes, too. 
It doesn't take a lot of imagination to add it all up. Well, has Ms. Cabot ever talked to you about all this? A couple of times. She'd come over, crying because of something George had said or done. She'd tell me. Mm-hmm. No, sir. No matter what it looked like, they weren't very happy. Did they have a quarrel that you know of? A lot of times. George used to yell at her, scream about her, leaving him alone. You could hear it over here. Summertime, you know, the windows are open, the sound carries right over. Mm-hmm. You couldn't really not hear it. And mind, I didn't try. Yes, we understand. Any of these quarrels ever get violent, do you know? You mean, did George ever hit her? That's right. Oh, you bet he did. Gave her a black eye once, took a couple of weeks for it to go away. Poor Ethel. She tried to hide it with makeup, but you could still tell. I see. When she left, did she say that she was going down to pick up her husband? Yeah. Told me she had to go get George. Made her a little mad tonight. Why is that? Missed the last part of the movie on TV. I see. Ethel had to leave before we found out who the swindler was. Uh-huh. Can you tell us what kind of a car the cab is driving? Pontiac. Cooper sedan. Sedan, light blue. Mm-hmm. What year? This one. Brand new. Mm-hmm. You happen to know the license number? No. Didn't give that to you. Didn't pay a lot of attention. Do you know if they do business with one service station? No, I can't tell you that. Can you give us a description of Mrs. Cabot? Sure. I'll give you a picture if you want one. We'd appreciate it. It's no trouble at all. Mm-hmm. I've got a scrapbook here. Shops of Ethel. Mm-hmm. That pencil sharpener I was looking for. Here now. Now I know it's here. Is that it there, the book? No, no, no. That's my high school annual. Now wait just a minute. Well, it is here. I know it is here. Oh, here it is. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I took all these myself. This man is very nice. Oh, that's my husband. I took that at Coronado Island one spring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here's one you can take. This one here in the chef's hat, that's Ethel. We were having a barbecue and she was the cook. It's a little fuzzy, but it gives you an idea what she looks like, you see. Mm-hmm. Well, her hair's cut short now. I had it cut last month, kind of uh, bob-like. Well, you can take it. Thank you very much, ma'am. You know, I just thought of it. You haven't told me what this is all about. Something happened to Ethel and George. Well, we're not sure yet. We're just checking out a complaint. Oh, well, as long as you're all right. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think that about covers it. I'd sure like to thank you for your cooperation. No, I'm happy to help. Good night, Miss Lawrence. Good night, Mr. Smith. Well, there's one more thing. Mm-hmm. Will you be home tomorrow if we have to get in touch with you? All day. If I don't answer right away, let the phone ring for a while. I got some work to do in the garden. All right, ma'am. Thank you very much. Well, I hope I helped you out. Good night. Good night. Good night. What do you think? I don't know. The way she tells it, something's out of line, isn't it? Well, Cabot seemed to be pretty upset when he got that phone call. There's only one big trouble with that. What do you mean? Maybe that's what he wanted us to think. Two forty-five a.m. Frank and I got back to the office. We ran the names George and Ethel Cabot through R and I, but we found no record on them. We sent a teletype to DMV up in Sacramento asking for all available information on a car registered to George Cabot or his wife or both. Frank went over to the business office to see if the men in the units that were keeping Cabot under surveillance had reported in. There were no messages. We made a 15.7 report directing it to Captain Lorman, telling him of what had happened and what action we'd taken. At 3.52 a.m., we were ready to leave the office. You know, sir? Yeah. Now, let's go. All right. I get it. Make it fast, huh? Homicide, Friday. Where? Yeah. Okay, we'll be right over. What do you got? Ethel Cabot. Yeah? I just found her. You are listening to Dragnet. The authentic story of your police force in action. Frank and I left the office and immediately drove over to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. When we got there, we talked to Dr. Sebastian and he gave us the whole story. The woman had been found lying by the roadside. She was picked up by a motorist. He'd taken her directly to the hospital. 
Sebastian went on to tell us that from her appearance, Ethel Cabot had been severely beaten and then rolled or dragged in hot tar. Her clothes were covered with it. Her hair was matted. The doctor said that the woman's head had been shaved and that most of the tar had been removed. A tentative identification had been made through a letter found on her person when she'd been brought in. An attempt was made to call her husband, but there was no answer at either the bar or at their home. Frank and I waited until the woman had been treated. Then we went in to talk to her. She was in a state of severe shock, and she was incoherent. Don't hit me anymore. Please don't hit me anymore. It's out of her hand. Yeah. I didn't do anything. Don't hit me. Miss Cabot. Miss Cabot. Please let me go. Please. You're all right now. There's nothing to be afraid of here. You're lying. You're in a hospital, Miss Cabot. You're all right. Don't let him get me anymore. Don't let him touch me. Nobody's going to hurt you, Miss Cabot. Where's George? We're trying to reach him, ma'am. I don't want to see him. Whatever. All his fault. George caused this? They told me. Well, who said that? Both of them. They said they were doing it for George. There were two people? Yes. They kept hitting me. They poured the tar over me. There wasn't anything I could do. Nothing. Did you know these men? They kept hitting me. George! George, tell them to stop. Not anymore, please. Not anymore. Miss Cabot, do you know who the two men were? No, I don't know them. They didn't have any reason to do it. Except for George. That's what they told me. I didn't know they were going to hit me like that. Did you hear a name? No, I don't know them. Did either one of them call a name of any kind? Please make them stop. Don't let them pour any more tar on me. Miss Cabot. Burns. I can't stand any more. Miss Cabot, can you tell us what the men look like? George. George, tell them to stop. Tell them. Miss Cabot. Oh, we're not going to get much more out of her, Joe. No. Better get a policewoman up here to stand by. Yeah. George. George, I can't stop. Joe? Yeah, Dave. While you were talking, the cabin woman call came in for you to get in touch with the business office. Okay, Dave, run away. They probably got a line on cabin, huh? Yeah. Hello, this is Friday. When? Okay, we're leaving right now. Right, bye. I'm not really tears it. What's that? I just lost the tail on Cabot. Frank and I went back to the office. We got in touch with the unit who'd been assigned to keep Cabot under surveillance. They told us that the man had gone downtown and had entered an all-night movie. In the darkness, he managed to get away. A team of men was sent out to his house, but he hadn't returned. A stakeout was set up on it. A check of his bar failed to yield any additional information as to his whereabouts. A local broadcast was sent out to all units asking that they be on the lookout for the man. If he was found, he was to be taken into custody, and we were to be notified immediately. 6.45 a.m. Frank and I checked out of the office, and we went home to shave and change our clothes. At 8.15 a.m., we got back to homicide. There was somebody waiting to see us. You want to see us? Are you Friday and Smith? That's right. I'm Arnold Leffer. I got something to tell you. All right. You heard from Cabot? No. Oh, I figured maybe he'd call you. You know him? Yeah, yeah, I work for him, help out in this place. You heard from him? Yeah, this morning. He called me at home. Did he say where he was? No, but I think he'd been drinking. He sounded like it. Yeah. It was either that or he was mad, one or the other. Is that right? Yeah, the last time I heard him talk like he did this morning was when he had that beef in the bar about a week ago. What was that all about? Oh, a couple of guys thought they were pretty rough, tried to prove it to George. Yeah. Well, he cleaned up the place with him. What caused that beef? Well, they started to get loud with a couple of girls in the place. George told them to quiet down. They didn't do it, so he told them to get out. Yeah. They didn't want to go, and they tried to put the muscle on George, but they tried it with the wrong guy. George really showed them. That's all? Oh, yeah. Bounced them both right out in the street. Guys were pretty sore about it. When did this happen? Uh, about a week ago. I don't remember the exact date. Mm-hmm. They were pretty sore. I told George they'd find some way to get even with him. I get it. Homicide Friday. He's not here right now. Can I take a message? Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. No, he's not working today. Yes, ma'am. 
Well, if you give me your number, I'll have him call when he gets in. All right. That's 9-8. Yes, ma'am. No, no, it's right in the message book. No, he'll see it. That's right. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. No, he'll look at the book when he comes in. No, the first thing. You bet. Well, you're more than welcome. Yes, ma'am. Bye. You know these two men? Yeah, I've seen them a couple times around the bar. You know their names? Well, one of them's called Jack something or other. I don't know the last part. How about the other one? I can't do any good there. You know where we can find them? Yeah, that's one of the reasons I come in here. I want to tell you what George said to me. Yeah. Well, he said he found out who kidnapped Ethel. Told me he was going to get him. He mentioned this Jack. Uh, figured it was the same guy. Where can we find him? Well, there's a rooming house over on 7th. I can show you. Well, let's go. Uh, look, there's something else, though. What's that? Well, I was at the bar when George called, and after I talked to him, I checked around. Yeah. His gun's gone. Frank and I left the office and drove over to 7th Street. The bar boy pointed out the rooming house where he said we could find Jack and his friend. We checked with the manager and found that two men answering the description we'd gotten shared a room on the third floor. We left Arnold Leffer in the car and we went up to the room. Should be the last one. Yeah. wonder if Cabot's gotten here yet. He has. Come on. Stick it in. All right, All right Cabot, let him go. I'm going to let him go. Oh, get, get, get him away. Come on. Please don't stop me. It's crazy. This guy's crazy. Come on, Captain. Take it easy now. Come on. Come on over here. Get over there. Why did you keep him away from me? Go on, move. Good. What do you think you're going to prove doing a thing like this, Cabot? A couple of minutes more, I wouldn't have cared. We found your wife. She's going to be all right. Yeah, I know. You didn't help yourself much doing a thing like this. He's crazy. You shut up. All right, now. Come on. Calm down, both of you, and stand still. All right. How about this one? Name's Rico Martin. Him and Jack took my wife. They admit it? Yeah, they said they did it to get even with me for the fight. Well, we didn't hurt her. We just scared her a little bit, that's all. They're right. Well, what difference does it make? We're going to beat it anyway. You are, huh? Sure. All we've got to do is come up with the right plea. And you got it all figured, haven't you? Sure. There's a lot of ways we can go. Yeah, we got one in mind. <laughs> just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 14th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Jack Prescott Bischoff and Rico Blake Martin were tried and convicted of kidnapping one count. They both received sentence as prescribed by law. Kidnapping with bodily injury is punishable by life imprisonment without possibility of parole or by death in the lethal gas chamber. 